right, uh, we have reconvened and there is nothing to report out from closed session. So I will adjourn the special meeting at 6.17 p.m. And at this time, I would like to call to order the Elk Grove City Council regular meeting. Today is Wednesday, June the 12th, 2024. It is 6.17 p.m. Clerk. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> This meeting of the Elk Grove City Council will be cablecast on Metro Cable 14, the local government affairs channel on the Comcast and AT&T U-verse cable systems. This meeting will be closed caption and webcast at metro14live.saccounty.gov. Tonight's meeting replays will be on Friday, June 14th at 1 p.m. and Tuesday, June 18th at 9 a.m. on Channel 14. Previous meetings can be viewed online at the 3 W's elkgrovecity.org or youtube.com backslash metrocable14. For members of the participating audience who may have personal electronic devices, please place them on silent mode during the meeting or on mute when you are not speaking. Elk Grove City Council welcomes, appreciates, and encourages participation in the City Council meeting. City Council requests that you limit your presentation to three minutes per person so that all present will have time to participate. City Council reserves the right to reasonably limit the total time for public comment on any particular noticed agenda item as it may deem necessary. Pursuant to resolution number 2010-24, no individual speaker concerning public comment may address the City Council for more than three minutes. If you wish to address the Council during the meeting, please complete a blue speaker card which can be found at the back of the chamber and provide it to Assistant City Clerk Brenda Haggard prior to consideration of the agenda item. With that, Mayor, I'll be moving into the roll call. And for the roll call, I will start with Councilmember Robles. Present. Councilmember Spees. Present. I will note that Councilmember Suen is absent. Vice Mayor Brewer. Here. And Mayor St. Allen. Here. Thank you. Next up is our land acknowledgement. Would the Vice Mayor please read our land acknowledgement? Thank you, Mayor. We honor, respect, and acknowledge Elk Grove's first inhabitants, the Plains Miwok, who lived as sovereign caretakers of this land and these waterways since time immemorial. We commemorate and advocate for their descendants, the Wilton Rancheria Tribe, the only federally recognized tribe in Sacramento County, who endure because of the bravery, resiliency, and determination of their ancestors, tribal members, and leaders. All right, thank you. Next up is our Pledge of Allegiance, and if I can get Council Member Spees to help lead us. Hand over heart, pledge. I, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Please join us for a brief moment of silence. Thank you. All right, next up is our approval of the agenda. May I get a motion? So moved. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Thank you. Next up, is, next item, please. Under Section 3, there are no closed session items on the regular agenda, which will advance us to Section 4, our presentations and announcements. And our first being Item 4.1, the presentation of the 2024 NorCal Cyber Mayor's Cup. Excellent. Um, I'd like to call up the Franklin High School. Woohoo! Yeah! <laughs> Thank you all so much for um, entertaining us here tonight. We appreciate it greatly. Um, this is Team Half Dome, who has evolved over time. You may remember them in 2021 as Anime Club. And we actually have uh, two of our uh, former students that are attending tonight that actually started this off in 2021 um, as Anime Club. They've evolved now into Half Dome, um, and we have the certificates that y'all have prepared for us. I'm going to introduce each kid and let each one have one, um, as well as uh, our mentor, George Valencia, um, is here tonight to help with that. So starting out on the left side, I have Priam Rangwala. Uh, Priam is one of our sophomores who has competed now for three years. Junior. Yes, I did say that, didn't I? <laughs> rising junior at no, this rising point. Senior. 
Gotcha. A rising senior. Rising <laughs> senior. Rising senior. Now I got it. I'm looking at the side. Never mind. Anyway, <laughs> Priam um, uh, has competed now in the national championship three years in a row and is looking forward to a fourth next year um, with Cyber Patriot. Um, but what we're doing here today, um, he's competed now three years in a row uh, with us also um, for the Mayor's Cup. Thank you, Priam. Appreciate it. Uh, Joshua Fong is our junior now rising junior, um, and he's our Cisco um, expert. He's our networking expert. Um, the Mayor's Cup consists of a variety of competitions, uh, or excuse me, of um, skill sets with um, open source intelligence, cryptography, um, uh, network uh, traffic analysis, log analysis, a variety of problem solving things, and uh, Joshua is uh, a great resource for our networking team. Thanks, Joshua. Eriko Akanuma is one of our freshmen, rising sophomore this year, um, who's going to be learning the Cisco networking capability also, um, is going to be a real big part for our team um, moving forward. Ethan Ho is our esteemed senior. Um, Ethan, again, has been a part of this team that's competed four years in a row to keep the cup here, and uh, we're definitely going to miss him this year. He's going to Stanford University, um, is going to continue on in cyber um, uh, competitions and um, uh, uh, computer science as he goes forward. His brother Matthew is coming up, uh, another um, freshman on the team this past year, rising sophomore. Um, we've got big expectations from a uh, little brother here coming up, <laughs> Ethan's brother. No um, pressure. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. All kinds of pressure. No, he's got to keep the family thing going. <laughs> And then um, Pratham Rangwala is our club president um, at Franklin High School and, again, has been part of this team now for um, the last three years. He's also um, uh, competed in the Cyber Patriot National Championship um, coming up, hopefully, on four years in a row. He's already competed four years um, with his brother, Priam, because they were in it during their middle school season as well. That's amazing. Anyway, that is Team Half Dome. Our congratulations. Thank wow. <laughs> We're going to come down there and take a picture with That everyone. would be wonderful. We have for you, for the fourth year in uh. a row, the NorCal <laughs> Mayor's Cyber Cup uh. that remains in Elk Grove Yay. for the fourth year in a row. Happy to keep thank it here. Thank you. Thank you. We got thank it. You, thank you. Come down. All right, let's go down. <laughs> And the kids have a little something um, for each one of you also. As you come down here, there's a, a Mayor's Cup challenge coin for each of you for our win this year. So proud of you. Congratulations. 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 Great work. Hey, congratulations. congratulations. Stanford, man. You got to go to Harvard now, right? <laughs> <laughs> congratulations. Great work, everyone. I'm going to stand here next to my trophy. Heck yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to hold it? It is yours to keep again. Yes. We appreciate you shining it off in your office. Absolutely. And uh, all those photography, uh, all those photo sessions. I love it. Yes, yes, yes. yes. We love it. Come Yeah, come join us. Come join us and then. This side's actually the fun side. Is it? Okay. Yeah, come over here. Yep, come right here. That's fine. It's got some good weight to it. <laughs> Okay, one, two, three. Smiles, everybody. All right, let's get a cheer. Woo! Woo! Yeah. Yeah. One more time. One more time. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And one more for the city page. Ready? One, two, three. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Great Wonderful. job, everyone. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Congratulations. We appreciate all that you've done for us. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. 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 Mr. Hey, congratulations. Yeah. Yeah. Coin. Yeah. Yeah. Got one. Yeah. And Mary yeah. Allen. Yeah. Yeah. So well, actually, I now have a challenge coin flag. Oh, yes. okay. Okay. If you would. Please. Wonderful. <laughs> Thank you all so much. <laughs> 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 That was great. All right, next up is our proclamation recognizing June 19th, 2024. It's Juneteenth. And I would like to call up Dr. Femi Omotesho. Are you in? There you are. Please join us. So whereas on 
September 22nd, 1862, the Emancipation Proclamation and Executive Order were issued by President Abraham Lincoln declaring the owning of slaves to be illegal effective January 1st, 1863. And whereas almost two and a half years later, on June 19, 1865, Union troops arrived in Galveston, Texas, bringing news of the proclamation and executive order that slaves should be freed. And whereas Juneteenth is a holiday commemorating the liberation of African Americans attained by the African American community's perseverance and innovation despite the perils faced, coupled with the proclamation and executive order outlawing, outlawing slavery. And whereas today, June 19th, Juneteenth celebrates African American resilience and achievement with the principles of self-determination, citizenship, and democracy. And whereas numerous residents, organizations, and businesses within the city of Elk Grove have demonstrated an unwavering commitment to promoting the ideals of Juneteenth through education, advocacy, and cultural celebrations, thus promoting a more inclusive and equitable community. Dr. Femi, I'd like to take a moment to recognize you specifically. Dr. Femi has been with the city, uh, has been a city employee for nearly five years, but she's been with the organization since 2013. Femi started her uh, journey as a volunteer. She was an Elk Grove Police Department ambassador, as well as a VIP. She was hired onto the city in 2019 as a customer service representative at the Elk Grove Animal Shelter. In 2022, Femi joined the city manager's office where she completes special projects, oversees the youth commission, and is, an integral, and is integral in the city's diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts. Femi's work related to DEI is helping our city to elevate and refine our efforts. Outside of work, Femi spends time with her twin daughters and son and is very involved in her church and continues her volunteer efforts. Femi, thank you for everything you do for this organization and to promote diversity, equity, and inclusion with our staff and our community. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor and Council Member. I'm deeply honored and humbled to receive this uh, proclamation in recognition of Juneteenth, 2024. This day symbolizes freedom, resilience, and the enduring spirit of the African-American community. Thank you for this meaningful gesture. Thank you. Thank you for all that you do. We'll join you downstairs. All right, uh, next is item 4.3, recognition of outstanding student leader, Alyssa Bentz, and presenting that is Councilmember Robles. Alyssa, are you here with us? Please come join us. <laughs> Hi, Alyssa. Hi. You can just come right up there, don't worry. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna be reading something. Um, the city of Elk Grove recognizes and appreciates you. And thank you for all your hard work that you've been doing, especially in school and everything. So uh, whereas Kiwana Clubs of Laguna Elk Grove supports service leadership programs for students participating in their school key clubs, sponsoring key clubs at Consumnes Oaks, 
Elk Grove, well, um, Elk Grove Laguna Creek, Monterey Trails High School. And whereas Key Clubs is the largest student-led service organization, over 200,000 members worldwide in three uh, states, districts, um, Cal, NAV, and HAP. I'm assuming that's California, Nevada, and Hawaii. Yes. And it's the largest district, over 25,000 members. Alyssa, Yessa? Uh, Isa. Isa, Bates. <laughs> okay, received a platinum member recognition um, as the Cal, NAV, and have distinguished lieutenant governor and earned the Robert F. Lucas Outstanding Lieutenant Governor for 23 through 24, guiding um, Key Club Division 7, South Key Club. So you're responsible for the high school, for the 10 high school clubs within the Elk Grove Unified District boundaries. That is awesome. And thank you for that. I can't imagine just how challenging that must have been, and you did an amazing job. So uh, encouraging her schools to serve over 27,000 hours of uh, service and raising um, $9,475 for fundraising initiatives, earning recognition for the most service performed of the year. Most funds raised of this year and most service performed um, per member within the entire uh, California, Nevada, and Hawaii district. The Division of Excellence Youth uh, for the year and now, now, therefore, let it be resolved that the city of Elk Grove hereby recognizes and celebrates Alyssa Vince for her dedicated service and extending our utmost appreciation and respect. Thank you for just leading the way. <laughs> that's a lot of students, 25,000, and you're doing it, so yeah. awesome. Thank and please, you so if you have much. anything you want to say, please do it. Oh, do I say something? Yeah, oh, oh. are you? Um, oh, where do I look? <laughs> um, uh, thank you so much for this recognition. Um, this is really such a great honor. Um, thank you to um, Laguna Elk Grove and like my Kiwanis Club. Um, thank you to Division 7 South and all its members um, in Key Club. Uh, I'm just filled with so much gratitude right now and I'm just in like so much shock. But um, thank you for everything and thank you for this award. Thank uh, you. Of course. Yes. Congratulations. Thank you. All right, we'll come down. Want to run for city council? Let us know. <laughs> you Congratulations. Thank you so much. Yes, against me. <laughs> oh, thank you. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, bring the family up. Oh, I'm, I'm honorary family. I'm <laughs> That's honorary family is great. Yeah, I'm the Simple Oaks uh, Kwanis advisor. Yeah. Yay, oh, go yeah. CO. So, Oh, man. <laughs> there you go. Thank you. Right. One more step that okay, way. It, yeah, must be, it must be without Darren. Yeah, we're off balance. Yeah. You have to maintain that balance. Yeah. We'll do our piece first. Okay, I'm going to read now. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> one more. One more. One more. One more. One more. Okay, ready? One, two, three. One more for good measure. One, two, three. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations thank you so again. Much. Great work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, next up is our Republic Services Annual Report. Presentation from Republic Services. Good evening. No need to come down and take any pictures with me, but uh, I will take any questions you have afterwards. So uh, good evening, uh, City Council, City staff, and residents of Elk Grove. My name is Ray Robinson. I am the Municipal Supervisor for Republic Services, your trash and recycling hauler for residential homes. And today I have the pleasure of presenting our results for the 2023 year. So Republic Services this past year have provided the traditional and additional services uh, to all of our residential homes in Elk Grove, including the collection of curbside trash, mixed recycling and organics, three bulky items uh, picked up per year, the home generated sharps, used oil and filters, 
and more. Oh. Here we go. And this past year, uh, we presented to schools in the Elk Grove Unified School District. Um, we did those in person. And of course, we presented the four R's of sustainability, reduce, reuse, recycle, and rot. They were well-received and impactful. And the compost workshops, which we actually just held one this past weekend, um, we hold those four times per year at the Elk Grove Community Garden. Um, at that workshop, we provide information and instruction on how to backyard compost. We provide compost bins, kitchen pails, as well as free compost. Republic Services has been uh, happy to participate in many different events in the city of Elk Grove, including the running of the Elk, Fit Fest, the Giant Pumpkin Festival, uh, Salute Red, White, and Blue, and all the other great events hosted in the city. So now for some results, the grand results from this past year. For garbage collected in 2023, totaled 40,233 tons. That is a 13% decrease um, since implementing food waste recycling required by Senate Bill 1383 in 2022, when we implemented it in July. We also had 189 yards of illegal dumping and uh, close to 6,200 tons of bulky item waste. Additionally, for organic waste, we collected 29,059 tons. That is a 23% increase year over year. So more organic waste, less trash. We are on the right track. Also, for all the other materials we collected in the city, uh, mixed recycling, 12,214 tons, e-waste 50 tons, used oil filters close to 7,000 gallons and 1,644 filters, 3,704 battery bags and 454 sharps. I got a few more numbers for you. So the diversion rate, which is the metric we use to uh, decide how much of the materials is actually being diverted from the landfills and hence being recycled. This past year, we achieved a 48.5% diversion rate. That is 3% more year over year, so an increase there. And um, it just shows the efforts between Republic Services and the city of Elk Grove, how far we've come and how much more we have to go. Finally, uh, I want to report on our customer satisfaction survey, which we are happy to report a 92% satisfaction across the respondents in this past year's survey, and we're ready to continue on and improve that number. So I want to thank uh, City Council, the city staff, the city, or uh, the residents of Elk Grove for another great year and looking forward to another one. All right. Well, thank you for that uh, great presentation. I uh, want to just also recognize and thank you and congratulate you on the active engagement and participation with the city of Elk Grove. And congratulations on the 92% overall satisfaction. That's tremendous. Great work. Any questions? Um, I'll start to the right. Questions or comments? Not so much questions, but just thank you for being involved and engaged in our community. We see it in every event that we have, whether it's the running, um, whether it's Fourth of July, whether it's whatever it is, you guys are super involved in our community. And we really appreciate that um, because you're engaged and not many folks are engaged, but Republic Service continues. So we truly appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, two instances of appreciation. So first of all, thank you very much for the, for the great update. Um, what was missing from that uh, was two things. One, um, our anti-trash uh, group here in Elk Grove uh, values very much the support that you give to them in terms of whether it's helping them get the, uh, the, the green vests or gloves or, trash or the grabbers, signs, everything. the trash grabbers. Mm -hmm. it's imp that's important because... 
people truly value a clean elk grove. And so the second is I want to appreciate, you know, uh, some responsiveness, again, related to some, uh, some litter uh, that was unfortunately uh, caused by one of the trucks inadvertently, right? But the phone call was made to Republic Services and said, hey, we, you know, we got an issue with broken glass that may have come from a, a truck. And you guys were responsive and you got out there and you cleaned it up. But things, things happen, right? Um, but what matters is how we respond to them. And so I want to thank you very much for um, having crews that are responsive and willing to help out. And um, so we really appreciate you. We value you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Vice Mayor, any comments, questions? <clears throat> yeah, I want to thank you for your presentation today. It was uh, is very helpful, very educational that, uh, that the numbers are being shared, but also the results that are being provided with it. Um, but I also appreciate what is not in this report is the education that you provide to our customers on the th programs that exist, things that you do and the things that you don't do because it really helps our customer base be more in tune with how we handle our waste management within our four walls. So when it's time for the trucks to come by during the week and do their green bin pickup, black bin pickup, or blue bin pickup, that people are actively doing um, the right thing and placing the right things inside these bins because um, we're, we're all doing our part to try and lower greenhouse gas emissions. We're all doing our part to have a, a cleaner, greener elk grove. And just all the partnerships that you do, not only with our volunteer groups, but with the city, is, is, is I really appreciate putting that best foot forward because that's, 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 what, uh, that's, that's what this partnership is all about. And so I really appreciate that. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you again for everything. Thank you. All right. Next item is 4.5, our Youth Commission semi-annual update. Presentation by our Youth Commission. All right. Good evening, Mayor and members of the City Council. I'm Femi Omotesho, Administrative Analyst in the City Manager's Office and advisor to this awesome group of um, L Group Youth Commission. I'm here with them today to present our report. This has been a consolidating year with so many accomplishments, and I'm very, very proud that this group has worked very hard to accomplish most of what they set out to do. The youth commissioners have organized several events, not only for teens, but also for families, demonstrating their passion for serving their community. Commissioners, I want to express my gratitude for your hard work over the last few months. Despite a heavy workload, you all rose to the challenge and completed everything flawlessly. In addition to presenting our reports today, we'll also be honoring our graduating seniors. I want to express my gratitude to our historian, Manjot, okay, for putting together an excellent PowerPoint presentation. Thank you very much. Now I'll give the floor to the commissioners to make their presentation. Please welcome Ella Buno, this year's um, chair, to start the presentation. Hi, I'm Ayla Buño, and I'm chair of the Youth Commission. Hi, I'm Cassie Parsons, and I'm the vice chair of the commission. Uh, Lindsay's on vacation, so she's not here, but she's secretary of the Youth Commission. Hi, my name is Abbas Chaudhry, and I'm the uh, communications officer. Hi, I'm Manjot Rai, and I'm the historian. Hi, my name is Om Shah, and I'm the Diversity and uh, Inclusion Liaison. Hi, I'm Jaden, and I'm a Youth Commissioner. Uh, hi, I'm Pratham, I'm also a Youth Commissioner. Hi, I'm Addie, and I'm a Youth Commissioner. 
Hi, I'm Adrian, and I'm a youth commissioner. Um, Mayor and council members, uh, it is with immense pride and gratitude that I stand before you today to reflect on my experience as chair of the Youth Commission over this past year. Um, through our initiatives, we aim to empower young people, giving them a platform to voice their opinions and contrib contribute to meaningful change. This year, we held Path to Positivity, our first city youth forum, Family Fun Day, the food drive, and our scholarships that we do every year. Back in January, we shared our plans for the year, and I'm pleased to report that we achieved our objectives and had a successful year. Uh, during our retreat on August 3rd, 2023, uh, we, we weren't able to form a quorum, but we did have a conversation with our city manager and, former youth, and a former youth commissioner. On October 10th, 2023, our city clerk, Mr. Lindgren, went over the Brown Act with all the commissioners. Okay, so for the second year, we had our Path to Positivity event, and we had a super good turnout, super good event this year. Um, hope to continue this in the future. We had about 100 participants, which was the max that we could have. It was in the ballroom at Wackford, and we had guest speakers. We had... Um, Animal services came with support animals. Um, we did crafts. We got to have different resources there. And then there was like food and music. And it was just a really good, fun, um, very learning and meaningful event that we had. So in March of this year, we held our first ever youth forum event at District 56, which was an event where youth in the community were able to interact with city leaders and learn more about their city. And this was the first time we ever held this event, but it was still a, a success as we had 20 participants who got to interact with the chief of police and the city manager. And we at the Youth Commission would like to thank the chief of police and the city manager for helping this event be a success. Okay. Um, so the Family Fun Day event was free for everyone to come together. It took place on April 13th and was located at the downtown plaza in Oda Grove. There was carnival games, a musician, music, free face painting, and food trucks that came. Although it did pour, there was a large outcome of people. And I think it was a very good event and had a very good outcome of people. So the food drive uh, was ran from May 6th to May 20th. Um, we had bins, uh, one here at the City Hall, uh, one at District 56, and one at the uh, uh, animal shelter. And we had three full, like, full bins. Um, so yeah, the event was a really good success. Uh, yeah, and just a few weeks ago, uh, on May 29th, we did a presentation to the Rotary Club, and um, it was out at Laguna Sunrise at the golf course, and we shared information about the history, purpose, composition, and activities of the Youth Commission. It is my great pleasure to announce the recipients of this year's Elk Grove Youth Commission scholarships. This year, we offered scholarships to four exceptional Elk Grove students who have excelled in their academics and gave back to their community, totaling $3,000. First, we have the $500 merit-based scholarship awarded to Logan East from Elk Grove High School. Next. Next, we have the $500 Community Impact Scholarship, which goes to Sarah Salim from the Cottonwood School. <laughs> Moving on to our Senior Community Impact Scholarship, we are awarding $1,000 to Hannah Nyo from Pleasant Grove High School. And lastly, we're pleased to present another $1,000 com Senior Community Impact Scholarship to Alexis Hawang from the best high school in Elk Grove and my alma mater, Consumna Stokes High School. <laughs> Congratulations to all our scholarship winners. Uh, 
I'd like to take a moment to recognize and commend our outgoing seniors. Mm -hmm. First, we have Ella Buino. Ella, please, can you step forward? Um, this is my third year on the commission. Uh, the first two years, I was... Oh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that was good. <laughs> Ella has, well, as she was saying, uh, <laughs> this is her third year. She has served on several um, committees, and she is the chair for this year. She was the vice last year. She has been a very, very dependable ally. She is a strong leader and very, very focused. I'm proud uh, to have had you, Ella, chair the commission this year. She's graduating from Pleasant Grove High School. Oh, Franklin High School, and we'll be going to UC Santa Cruz to study political science. Woohoo! Go, Ella! <laughs> Next, Jaden, please step forward. This is Jaden's second year on the Youth Commission. He's very, very level headed and brings a, <laughs> brings a calming effect to our decision making processes. Um, he was a historian uh, last year and brought his IT, IT skills to bear. I'm very, very proud and honored to have written several scholarship recommendations for him and glad he received so many offers. And that's why he's so passionate about scholarship. Um, JD will be going to Calpol uh, and uh, Calpoli and will be um, studying computer science. Thanks. All right, way to go, Jaden. And last but definitely not the least, we have Cassie. Cassie has been with the commission for four years. She has been the longest ever serving commissioner that we have. And um, she was a two-time chair and currently vice chair. Um, currently, um, this year she was nominated as uh, the junior uh, youth volunteer of the year, and she was um, awarded that award by the mayor. Cassie will be going to CSU Long Beach, and she will be double majoring in sports management, pre kinesiology, and public policy and administration. All right, wow. Cassie. <laughs> All right, Cassie. <laughs> So we have three spots open on the Youth Commission and applications will be available very soon. You can find out more information about application or updates on the Youth Commission on our website and using the QR codes on our presentation. That will conclude our presentation. Thank you for your time. Great work, everyone. Um, we'll appreciate if you can please take a picture with the recipient and the graduates. Very good. I just, before we go down there, I just want to say thank you for an amazing, successful year. You guys have been just doing an amazing job and super proud of uh, those who got the scholarships and those who are graduating. Thank you for paving the way for others. So appreciate it. Thank you. All right. A few more over here. Karen, <laughs>
Thank you. Congratulations. Can we, can we get one everyone. with the council and just the graduating seniors? Also? Sure. It's just the graduating seniors. <laughs> That was great. Next up is public comment. We have two people signed up to speak, starting with Zell Lee and then followed by Lynn Wheat. Hello, hello, hello. Uh, first of all, I would like to say I truly commend what you're doing, especially you, Mayor, because you will probably go home and recognize my name later. But you have always made sure that my emails or my phone calls were replied to. But I had uh, three questions or concerns. Uh, the first one is that I noticed that there's a section of new developments coming to Elk Grove. And my question is, um, what would be the impact on the city regarding the schools, the uh, traffic, the public services, and, and the um, police, and how would they be impact? And my second thing here was, is the Mesa developer a part of this new uh, set of developments that are coming in? And if so, how is that being addressed? And my third comment is that I am very, very proud of the youth, but we all are the same color because it's hot. So we've all tanned, right? <laughs> but I am just wondering what effort is being made to include or to try to recruit African, Amer true African American students. And if there's something in place, I'm not seeing that being represented. So those were my three uh, statements, comments, or questions. So no. So this is public comment. So we 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 won't be able to provide you answers, uh, but we will make sure that your questions are answered. Okay. And I certainly will respond um, as well. I uh, know you probably <laughs> will. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. Everybody's doing a great job. Thank, Thank you. you. Next up is Lynn Wheat, and that is our final public comment. Good evening. Elk Grove has a number of different media sites, and one that I go to on a regular basis is elkgrovenews.net. And there are several articles that have been published on, his, on uh, the website, and there's one in particular that was called, This Doan Fella Seems Like a Real Piece of Work, But His Actions Are On Point for a Government Official. And that was on June 3rd, 2024. I'd like to read, you're able to comment on his articles, and I'd like to read you one comment because I think it's really um, relevant and I somewhat agree with it. The city's evolving economic development strategy is like shooting buckshot. It's sloppy and misses more than it hits. First, we were the sports mecca, home of a professional soccer team and Olympic swim trials. Result, 
A tractor warehouse sits on the stadium site, and the swimming pool is full of red ink and needs resurfacing after only five years. Then we were the high-tech mecca, the new Silicon Valley of the Central Valley. The press reports gloated that we already had Apple, and the city just landed a small build-to-order circuit board assembler from Fremont. Result? The small circuit board company from Fremont never came and appears to be out of business. Apple was never in Elk Grove. Apple contracts with an employment agency that hires low-paid workers to fix broken iPhones. After giving up the strategy of creating livable wage jobs, the city has now pivoted to chasing the almighty sales tax dollar, specifically by promoting food and beverage businesses. Never mind that retail jobs are among the lowest paying jobs and rarely offer benefits. It's all about the Benjamins, baby. Now we will have a $300 million zoo, phase one, mind you, and the Economic Development Department is saying that we will be a West Coast destination. Personally, I think Doan would have a better chance of success feeding our money into a slot machine at Sky River Casino. Thank you. Thank you, and that's our final comment. So I will close the public comment opportunity, and we will move on to our next item. Good evening, Madam Mayor, Vice Mayor, members of the City Council, Jason Berman, City Manager. Several items to report on this evening. Um, first of all, as you know, we concluded our, our first inaugural Elk Grove 101 um, to great success, and we had so much interest, we're going to be doing it again coming up later this summer. So applications are currently being accepted for the next cohort of our Elk Grove 101 um, through June 24th. This is an immersive seven-session course designed to engage, empower, enlighten community members about their local government. It's free. Open to anyone 18 and older who lives or works in our community. Classes will meet weekly from August 20th to October 1st from 6 to 8 p.m. in District 56. And uh, you can sign up on the city's website. Mutual housing will host the second of a series of community meetings for their planned 89-unit senior housing complex in Old Town. Um, it'll be tomorrow, June 13th, from 5.30 to 7.30 um, p.m. at the Elk Grove Public Library, 8900 Elk Grove Boulevard. Um, happy to, uh, to announce the Smithsonian Traveling Exhibit. It will be arriving in Elk Grove shortly. The Bias Inside Us Smithsonian institution, institution Project is coming to Elk Grove. Traveling Exhibition is being presented in partnership by the Elk Grove Unified School District and the City of Elk Grove to increase awareness of implicit bias and its impact. The exhibit will provide insights from the science of bias and strategies for challenging these biases in ourselves and our community. The exhibit is, exhibit is open Monday through Saturday, 10 a.m. to 5 p.m., June 17th through July 12th at Elizabeth Pinkerton Middle School, which is 8365 White Walk Parkway. Extended hours are also available on select dates. Admission is free. Details are available on the Elk Grove School District website, egusd.net. Elk Grove Police Department has partnered with Kasumna CSD, Parks and Recreation, to host two one-day soccer camps at Bartholomew Sports Park, June 17th and 18th. The camp will teach fundamentals of soccer, good sportsmanship, and teamwork to players ages 4 through 12 in a safe and fun environment. Uh, Elk Grove Aquatic Center will host a special dive-in movie on June 22nd. Guests can enjoy the film Despicable Me 3 from the facility's pools. Gates open at 4. Admission is $8.00. For those five and up, $5 for ages two through four, and free if you're under two. Uh, more information on the, C on the CSD's website. Elk Grove, Elk Grove Code Enforcement, PD, and Consumers Fire are working hard to decrease dangerous uh, illegal fireworks in Elk Grove before the July 4th holiday. The agencies will host a firework amnesty event on June 29th from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. at Fire Station 71, which is at 8760 Elk Grove Boulevard. Residents can turn in illegal fireworks for proper destruction, no questions asked. Look for more information about this event on the city and the CSD social media accounts. Um, applications are being accepted now for Pitch Elk Grove 2024. The third annual startup competition will be held on September 19th at District 56. Startups will compete for a chance to win their share of $20,000 in prize money. Applications are due on July 15th. Visit startupsac.com for more details. And finally, the Sacramento Area Sewer District will install a transmission pipeline 
along Franklin Boulevard from Sims Road to Whitelock Parkway and along Willard Parkway from Whitelock Parkway to Matina Drive to support their harvest water project. The construction will include major traffic impacts on the city's west side, especially Franklin Boulevard, where traffic will be reduced to one lane in each direction starting in July. Motorists will be encouraged to use alternate routes or plan for delays. Details about the project can be found in the Harvest Water webpage at sacsewer.com. Residents can also call the district's hotline at 916-876-3322. And that concludes my report. Happy to answer any questions the council might have. Thank you. Thank you for your report. Any questions or comments? Seeing none, we'll move on to our next item. Next item is our consent calendar items. At this time, I will open up public comment opportunity. Seeing that nobody has signed up to speak, I'll close public comment opportunity and look for a motion to approve the consent calendar. So moved. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Thank you. All right, item 8.1. A public hearing to consider a resolution setting residential solid waste ser service rates for fiscal year 2024-25. Good evening, Mayor Singh Allen, members of the City Council. My name is Kimberly Taylor, and I'm the manager for the Recycling and Waste Division within the Public Works Department. And the item I'm presenting before you tonight is a public hearing to consider a resolution setting residential solid waste rates for fiscal year 2024-2025. Oh, not that one. There we go. So Republic solid, uh, residential solid waste services in the city of Elk Grove are provided through Republic Services. You heard from the Municipal Supervisor, Ray Robinson, earlier tonight about the work that they're doing in Elk Grove. Um, and he presented you earlier with their annual update. Republic Services is entitled to an annual adjustment to their rates in accordance with the current franchise agreement, an adjustment that is based on changes to the consumer price index. An increase in the CPI reflects costs for solid waste services related to labor, fuel, landfill fees, and regulatory fees. Over the past 12 months, the consumer price index for garbage and trash increased 7.3%, according to the Bureau of Labor and Statistics. The city's contract with Republic Services states that the annual adjustment be capped at 3%, however, which is the rate increase staff are proposing in this public hearing, since the CPI over the past year exceeded that 3% amount. The proposed 3% rate increase will affect all three trash cart sizes available to Elk Grove residents, the smallest 32-gallon trash can, the standard 64, and the larger 96-gallon roll cart. The city's admin fee will also be adjusted 11 cents in accordance with the rate increase from $3.53 to $3.64 per service account. The comprehensive table on the slide that may be tricky to see um, was included in a staff report and was also sent out um, to the public through our public notices. And it includes what a 3% increase would mean for residents who utilize the standard 64-gallon cart size, as well as all the alternative sizes, the 32-gallon, the 96-gallon, as well as multiple garbage carts. This uh, table is quite detailed because that lower section goes into if you have two 32-gallon carts or one 64-gallon cart and one 32-gallon cart. So it really breaks down for all service levels what this 3% increase will look like. Most residents in Elk Grove have a 64-gallon roll cart for their garbage service, and a 3% rate increase, as proposed, would equal $1.04 per month increase in fiscal year 2024-25. The proposed 3% rate increase keeps up the city of Elk Grove well below the average solid waste rates in the region. You can see, looking at this uh, table, this is graph, excuse me, Elk Grove is on the side in green, and we're still well below the average local rate, which is $45.95. The Elk Grove average rate is $35.48. The annual solid waste, solid waste rate increase must follow the procedural requirements of Proposition 218, which dictates that fees for refuse collection service be noticed no less than 45 days of the posted hearing happening this evening. During the last week of April, 51,388 notices were mailed to all residential solid waste service property owners and bill receivers detailing the proposed rate increase and providing notice of tonight's hearing. Two public hearing notices were also published in the local newspaper on May 24th and May 31st of this year, 
um, with the notice. For a majority protest to exist under Prop 218, written protests must exceed 50% of the parcels impacted by the fee. The city has approximately 50,000 parcels or residential service addresses, which means that approximately 25,000 written protests would be required to halt the rate proceedings. My most recent update from the city clerk was that the city has received 26 protests, which does not meet the, th meet the threshold for majority protest. The image on the screen is the visual of the mailer that we um, that the city mailed out to over 51,000 residential solid waste service property owners and bill receivers at the end of April, and it was also in the council packet for this evening. In conclusion, staff recommends the city council adopt the resolution setting solid residential solid waste rates for fiscal year 2024-25, effective July 1st, 2024. Thank you, and please let me know if you have any questions. All right, thank you for your presentation. At this time, I will declare that the public hearing is now open and open up the public comment opportunity. We have two people signed up to speak. We'll start with Greg Waldron, followed by Kimberly Kennedy Woods. Good evening. My name is Greg Waldron. I live at 9801 Amenity Circle, kind of behind Mark Offer Elementary. Uh, when I received the notice of uh, proposed adjustments in solid waste, I decided to do some uh, research. Um, the Republic Services net worth is $40 billion. Republic Services CEO is John Van Ark. His total annual salary and compensation is $11.8 million. His net stock worth is 25, uh, 50, excuse me, $15 million. There are four district sub-directors on the Board of Republic Services, which annual salaries range from 3.5 million to 4.5 million. The leading stockholder with 34% of the stock in Republic Services is Bill Gates. Uh, the former CEO of Services, Donald W. Slager, his stock net worth is $57 million. Now, what I want the city council to do is explain in detail, in writing, why Republic Services needs to raise the rates. Thank you. I'm sure uh, the CEO, when he goes to the market with his wife, goes, honey, I don't think we're going to be able to add that extra gallon of milk this, uh, this week. We're going to have to you know, cut our budget. That's what everybody else is doing, but not these guys. And we don't need to raise the rates. That's what I got to say. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Kimberly Kennedy Woods. Good evening. Thank you for this opportunity. So I'm here also to oppose the rate increase, largely based on the fact that we had an increase, just had an increase last year. Um, to my understanding, the increase last year was based on the changing of the cans to colorful cans, um, not anything that I think the people of Elk Grove voted on, but something that was decided without our input. And I didn't need color-coded cans. And when we had that increase, my family and I did everything that we could do to keep our costs down. So we went to the smallest cans for each color. Again, um, the people of California, let alone the people of Elk Grove, pocketbooks are strapped in all directions. There's no release coming our way. There are no increases in our pay. And so to have another increase in the green waste or in, in the um, waste management for the people of Elk Grove is another thing taxing the pocketbooks of families. Again, um, we don't have the opportunity in this to make any adjustments to keep our prices down because it's just an increase. Whereas before, at least if we wanted to go to a smaller can to keep the prices down, we could do that. Also, uh, the report, I, I appreciate the services of Republic Services. I wanted to put that in as well. But as they reported, the people are working together. Is this how you show your appreciation that we're working together, things are better, by putting an increase on them? 
Is that the way we say thank you? So thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, ma'am. Um, that is our final public comment. So I will go ahead and close the public comment opportunity and declare that the public hearing is now closed and open it up for council comments or questions. I'll start to the right. Councilmember Robles. Uh, no questions. Councilmember Spees. Sorry. Um, the, so the CPI that we give that is, or that is in the contract caps out at 3% per year, correct? And, and that's, that's specifically stated within a contract that we negotiated how many years ago? A couple. Just a couple years ago. Two. Mm -hmm. Okay, a couple years ago. Renegotiated due to the SB 1383 mm -hmm. imposition. Right. Okay. And um, so real quick, like 1383 essentially did what? Go to the high level for me. Imposed uh, requirement to uh, recycle your organic food waste or organic waste. No longer able to put in your black, well, it was now a black uh, regular waste cart. You have to recycle them, put them in the new waste cart, which has other additional collection requirements and sorting requirements imposed upon us and Republic Services. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so that was, um, and, and that actually was what caused the need for the change in the color of the waste bins, right? Correct. It was also a state law that required it, not something the city of Elk Grove decided to do. Right. State laws. So our, our California legislature made the decision for Senate Bill 1383. Correct. Correct. Without yeah. going to voters, but they yeah they made it law at okay. state level. Perfect. Mm -hmm. All right. And so as a result of that, that's why we well I think we were up on the contract anyway. We had to renegotiate it, but of course they have in there which is standard with most contracts, most of the contracts I deal with that are over, over years, gives a CPI inflation. That's, that's very standard, right? Mm -hmm. And so what I'm hearing is that actual costs went up 7%, but we're capped at three, right? Which is actually a very smart protection for us, right? Which is actually to the detriment of, of Republic Services because they're paying 7%, but they're only getting three, right? Okay. Um, yeah, so... I get it. Costs are, I mean, costs are going up. Um, costs for everybody are going up. And not everybody's getting a raise. And so I'm, I'm going to save some of my com comments about this to my, to my, uh, my comments at the end um, and maybe what we can come back with later. Um, but it's, um, I, I get it. SSI went up probably not even 3%, right? So people are feeling the pinch. And if you think about it, a dollar and four cents makes a difference to some people. So I get it. I understand this is negotiated. It was uh, the, the negotiation or the renegotiation a couple of years ago was, was spurned mostly by Senate Bill 1383. Um, I'll make the motion to approve it. Uh, I know that doesn't make everyone happy, but um, that's our contractual requirement. So. Thank you, sir. We have a motion, but we'll continue on the deliberations and questions. Our vice mayor, any questions, comments? I, I do have a question. Um, for the actual 3% increase, um, what are the benefits of the 3% of the increase? Well, the, first of all, as Councilmember Spee said, it's contractually, contractually required for us to... No. Uh, uh, what, are the, what are the benefits? Because we have the black bin, the blue bin, the green bin. Mm -hmm. And is it for the benefit of increasing participation in the recyclable side of the business for the blue bins to be used and for the clippings and the organics for that processing and recycling for on that end. Um, because as Mr. Waldron had stated, and as Ms. Kimberly has stated, you have some households that just cannot muscle up that extra 3% per month. And looking at the spreadsheet itself and, and the postcard that we all received in May, um, does that 3%, is that applicable across all three bins for the program or is it, or is it just for, just for the use and for the benefit of Republic Services providing our, our weekly 
waste services. Yeah, so the monthly cost covers the cost for actually all three carts, right? It's really only our municipal code mandates you have service for the waste cart yeah. in and of itself, and that's what really waste covers. Everything else comes included with that. So that covers the cost of your, your um, regular waste service, mixed recyclables, and the organic waste cart. Thank you, Mr. Werner. You're welcome. That, 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 that's, that's the answer right there because um, I think that's, that's the growing frustration that we're seeing from a lot of our residents is that inflation, even though it's starting to like flatten out and slow down nationally, individually, each household is still having to feel some sort of pain and burden of what to decide because as prices are starting to stagnate, um, everything else continues to be at the higher levels. Nothing has gone down from before and a lot of families are still hurting and still trying to figure out exactly how am I going to what, what do I need to make decisions on? How do I take care of my kids? How do I take care of my, 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 my parents? Or how do I take care of, of my loved ones who are, who are living with me? Because some, because some people have relatives that are, that, that, that are dependent on them. And if they're not making the six-figure salary that, uh, that would allow some families and some households to say, I can handle this. There are some that are really making that hard decision and some that are living in less than ideal circumstances that still have, they're still hanging on and still making ends meet. And so 1383, again, um, has caused a, a, a situation, even though it means well, it's tying a lot of people's hands um, and making some very hard decisions. But understanding what the, what the increase is for, and this is a renegotiation from a couple of years ago. We probably need to, um, as a true partner, just starting to look at ways to help keep things going in a more affordable manner. Affordability is definitely the coin of the realm um, on a lot of different levels over the next five years. And so it's something we definitely want to start talking about earnestly and honestly and figuring out how we can try and save costs for, for our residents and, and our neighbors. But I second... Um, Mr. Spies's motion because it, I mean, it, it's, it's, uh, it's, it is what it is, but we got, but, um, but we got to do what we can to keep moving the needle forward. But this should, hopefully this is an eye opener for all of us to have earnest conversations with, with, with our partners. Matt, Madam Mayor, I know, <clears throat> I know that you're going to be giving your deliberation as well. Um, but after that, I would like to hear what Councilman Spies um, has in mind. If, I don't know if you want to do it after this, or do you want to do it during the, uh, I, during the budget hearings? Or I'm open to hearing what you have to say. Um, you know, I think I share the same frustration and concerns for our residents, but um, the rate increase of three percent is well below the um, you know the seven point three, and what and we still have we are still far below what you're seeing um, with local rates. So I, you know, I want to be measured in, in terms of my, my outlook on this. Um, yes, it's an increase. Um, it is a modest increase, and I understand very much that some families live paycheck to paycheck. Um, I know the, you know, the customers at the food bank, they grow every single day. So I'm well aware of the growing need evolves every single day. But I also believe that, you know, we have a contractual obligation and we have to meet those um, requirements. Uh, did you have something else that you wanted to say? So no, actually, thank, thank you for your support on that, um, but I think it's probably best uh, into the broader conversation of budget or even perhaps um, my comments later on things we want to bring back, but okay. um, I'm good for now. I want to keep, right, so I want we, to keep this clean. Yeah, let's let's keep, keep it clean. All right, sounds good. All right, well, we have a motion and a second. Um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Thank you very much. We will move on to our next item, item 8.2. 8.2 is actually two public hearings for the 96 annexation of Community Facilities District 2006-1 and the 66 annexation to Stormwater Drainage Fee Zone 2 for the projects that staff will outline. <clears throat> Good evening, Madam Mayor. Vice Mayor and Council Members. I am Vijay Maceria, Financial Analyst for the City. 
I'm here this evening to present two pr proposed annexations into the city's special tax districts. The city maintains eight special tax districts which provide for infrastructure or service, services such as police maintenance, street maintenance, street lighting, and storm water drainage. Annexations into the appropriate districts are typically part of a new development project's approval process. The requirements are specific for each project and vary according to the geographic location and building use. The ta special taxes are subject to annual rate adjustments. On April 24, 2024, the City Council adopted resolutions of, of intent to annex these projects into the applicable special tax districts and to establish tonight's public hearing. Note, Tegan Estates is owned separately by the Hensley Family Trust and Mark F. Priest. The projects are proposed for annexation into the following special tax districts. CFD 2006-1, Maintenance Services, Stormwater Drainage Fee Zone 2, Stormwater Drainage and Maintenance. This is the 96th annexation into the CFD 2006-1 and the 66th annexation into Stormwater Drainage Fee Zone 2. The Tegan Estates project was previously annexed into CFD 2003-2 Police Services and CFD 2006-1 Maintenance service, Services on March 22, 2006. Lastly, it was annexed into Street Maintenance District Number 1, Zone 2, on April 25, 2006. This assessment will be levied in perpetuity. The first project is Staybridge Suites Amendment Project, which consists of 1.84 non-residential acres located southwest of Laguna Boulevard and Harbor Point Road. The second project is Tegan Estates Project Part 1, owned by the Hensley Family Trust, consists of 36 single-family residential units located northeast of Franklin Boulevard and Laguna Boulevard. Lastly, Tegan Estates Project Part 2, owned by Mark F. Priest, which consists of three single-family residential units located northeast of Franklin Boulevard and Laguna Boulevard. This concludes my presentation. Thank you for your time and consideration. Please let me know if you have any questions. All right, thank you for that presentation. At this time, I will declare the public hearing for CFD 2006-1 Annex 96 is open and open up the public comment opportunity. I don't see anyone sign up to speak on this. I'll close the public comment opportunity and declare the public hearing for CFD 2006-1 Annex 96 is closed and look for a motion one. Motion A1. Second. It's just motion one right now. Or motion one. one. Yeah. And second. I'm sorry. Second. It's... All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All right. Um, next is, let's see, re requesting the results of the ballot tabulation. Indeed, of two possible votes, two affirmative votes were cast authorizing the city of Elk Grove to levy a special tax at the rate apportioned and described. The measure passes with more than two-thirds of all votes cast in the election in favor of the measure. Resolution declaring the results of the election is available for council consideration. All right, looking for motions A2 and A3. So, mo so moved. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Thank you. All right, uh, next I will declare the public hearing for SWDF Zone 2, Annex 66 is now open, and open up public comment opportunity. Uh, no one has signed up to speak. I'll close public comment opportunity and declare the public hearing for SWDF Zone 2, Annex 66 is closed, and request the clerk to provide the results of the ballot tabulation. There is no majority protest of 41 possible votes weighted according to the proportional financial obligation for the properties. 41 affirmative votes were returned. The ballots approved the proposed assessments and the proposed inflation adjustment limits described for all the parcels identified in the ballots. A resolution determining levy assessments in the district is available for council consideration. All right, looking for motion B. So moved. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Thank you. All right, on to item 9.1, consider a resolution adopting the budget for fiscal year 2024-25, setting the annual appropriations limit, adopting the fiscal year 2024-25 investment policy, and adopting an updated citywide salary schedule. 
Good evening, Mayor Singh Allen, Vice Mayor, and members of the Council. I'm Nathan Bagwell. I have the pleasure of serving as your Budget Manager and presenting to you the fiscal year 2024-25 uh, proposed budget. I just would like to start off and, and give my sincere thanks to city staff. This is a pretty large effort organizationally, all the way from the analysts to the management team to department heads. Uh, we got a lot of guidance and uh, support from our city manager, Mr. Behrman, as well as our finance director, Mr. Matt Pollan. And of course, we couldn't do this without our, our wonderful analyst, uh, Matt Ruiz, who was with us this evening, and uh, Cecilia Long as well. Uh, so with that, uh, what we're going to cover this evening is we're going to talk about some public outreach efforts we've done throughout the year. There have been a few changes since the last time we brought this before you at the May 22nd Council meeting. We're going to take a very high-level look at the Capital Improvement Program, which we will be bringing back as a public hearing in two weeks. Uh, but it is important to note that year one of that is included in this year's 24-25 uh, budget, but we will be bringing back the entirety of the CIP in two weeks. We'll then transition over to Measure E. We'll talk about the general fund, five-year forecast from the budget document. We'll discuss proposed personnel changes, and then we'll come back to the council for uh, actions and direction. So throughout the year, uh, staff had the opportunity to engage in enhanced public uh, engagement efforts, uh, whether it was through Elk Grove 101, supporting the Measure E Oversight Committee, and even during different gathering opportunities. Finance staff was proactive in messaging and looking to reach various audiences within the community. Virtually, with the support of our public affairs amazing team, uh, we sent out just under 4,000 emails in our Week at a Glance email. We also have a budget listserv that reaches over 300 residents or, or excuse me, subscribers. Uh, on social media, we uh, reached out with three, over 3,000 impressions. Uh, upon adoption, it is our intention to release a press release. And at, for the upcoming year, we also want to reiterate that we are looking at expanding our efforts to, of outreach, uh, not only utilizing technology, but we are also exploring additional community engagement opportunities. So there have been a few changes since the last time we discussed the budget with you a few weeks ago. Uh, we've moved from a $373 million budget to 374. In totality, that's a $1.3 million increase. One million is to Wilton Rancheria. This is uh, Fund 246. This is, a, um, this is the, the casino fund. This is due to revised project costs for Cameron Road. Another million is anticipated state grant funding that has changed for the library project. There's a reduction in gas tax. This is a revised project costs for the city's intelligent transit system. And then a small increase to the community development block grant funding. Uh, this is relative to the citywide curb ramp project. So as we mentioned, we're going to just take a, a very high-level look at the CIP. Uh, tonight's item includes year one of the plan, as detailed the budget document. The CIP in its entirety will be coming back again in two weeks, but as a preview, uh, this is the total plan appropriations. It is about $276 million over the five years. Uh, about 57% or $158 million is funded, and roughly 43% or $117 million is identified as unfunded, and you can find it there on the chart, mostly listed under potential grants. Uh, you can find a version of this chart on page 268 of the budget document. Some highlights. Our, our, our team's going to be busy in the coming year uh, from the capital improvement plan. Uh, there's a, there's a projects that are either in construction or priority projects that are advancing in the coming fiscal year. As you can see, there's trails, numerous parks, library improvements, storm drain improvements, extending Camera Road to Bruceville, improvements to Grant Line and Wilton Road, as well as annual pavement maintenance. And just once again, we'll be bringing this back as a public hearing item in a couple weeks. That brings us to Measure E. And as you recall, in November of 22, the Elk Grove voters approved Measure E. This is a one cent transaction and use sales tax. This approval was the culmination of a year-long public outreach process undertaken by the city and our partner, the CSD. The Measure, the measure E Citizens Oversight Committee met on February 13th of this year to look, at, look over the current year 23-24 expenditure plan and update. They met again last month on May 6th and found that the city's and CSD's expenditure plans for the upcoming fiscal year do reflect the needs and priorities identified by the community and they voted to recommend approval to the city council. Just want to point out kind of in this chart here that we have a total estimated revenue, oh, sorry for the year one, that's, that's a typo, but the estimated revenue in the coming year is $30 million. Essentially what that looks like then if we go to the next slide, is you take that 30 million and then we spread it out over the priorities as identified 
uh, through our outreach and, and, and what was set up for the Measure E program. 20% goes to future product priority projects. So we see our partners at the CSD, 20% for fire and 10% and for parks and rec. And then reducing crime is also a large component of this. So we, I'm gonna go back here and show you this chart again. There's 15 million of that 30. That's actually the city's component. So now we're gonna go and look at the city's breakout of this priority. Oh, somehow I went all the way to the end of this one. So there you go. You get to go back now. That's fun. Okay. So this is the city's breakout by priority. And you'll notice at the top it mentions 16.8 million. Why is it more than 15? Well, that's because there's some capital that's unspent rolling over from 24 into 25, explaining that. And we're gonna get to uh, get to get to share some of the exciting highlights of Benjamin for the upcoming year. Just a couple of slides here, but just kind of uh, start at a real high level, and then we're going to get into some of the exciting things happening in the coming year, as funded through Measure E for reducing crime and crime prevention, adding two officers, a training team officer and a commercial enforcement officer, to dispatch supervisors, and we're adding 10 additional flock cameras, which are uh, safety license plate readers, and that, I believe that will bring us to a total of about 70 at various intersections uh, throughout the city. Uh, regarding homelessness, uh, we will provide interim shelter options, via a winter sanctuary to city residents experiencing homelessness during the winter. We'll look to continue this effort in the coming fiscal year and permanent housing support as well. This will include operational subsidies for city owned permanent housing. It might also include operational funding for new permanent supportive housing built in the city, ongoing vouchers or subsidies for those exiting homeless, homelessness, excuse me, and support services, supportive services to assist people with remaining stably housed. Uh, clean and safe public areas, graffiti abatement. Abatement will continue in the upcoming year. The Keep Elk Grove Clean pilot project. These are ongoing campaigns that include education and promotion and increased native tree planting, trash receptacles, and mutt mitt stations along trails, creeks, channels, and roadsides. The project also includes funding for homeless camp cleanup work. For economic development, there are some exciting programs and projects funded in the coming year, such as Project Elevate, a facade improvement program, brew incentive program, funding for the Grant Line Business Park and the Elk Grove Innovation Center, as well as Auto Mall Next, which is a master plan to help position the Auto Mall for maximum success over the next 25 years. Next is a discussion about maintaining streets and traffic. Uh, Measure E will finance the overlay of Laguna Boulevard from just west of Laguna Springs Drive intersection to Bruceville Road. This also includes completion of any remaining deep lift repairs not completed using fiscal 24 funds. The citywide traffic signal enhancement and congestion relief project was advanced through final design. Con construction contract was awarded at the May 22nd council meeting and construction is expected to be complete in the fall of 25. Our partners at the CSD have been very busy uh, as far as fire protection services, a significant portion of their funding is dedicated to fire protection services. <clears throat> As mentioned here on the slide, 15 safety personnel were added in FY24, 12 firefighters, paramedics, three battalion chiefs. Uh, for the upcoming year, along with the continuation of recruitment efforts and onboarding new staff, we also anticipate procurement of new emergency vehicles and fleet replacement. Relative to parks and recreation, there are several repairs and amenity replacements occurring within the city, such as resurfacing a basketball court, Restroom, and repair, restroom repairs and improvements at two parks, lighting at Lippincott Park, slide replacement at the Water Wackford Community Center, and Beeman Park revitalization. That then leads us into the general fund for fiscal year 25. The general fund maintains and enhances city service levels. It is structurally balanced. The revenues are more than the expenditures and it is sustainable, as you will see when we consider the five-year forecast in just a moment. It also provides for council priority projects and it continues to increase the city's reserves over the horizon of the, of the, of the five-year forecast. So we'll start with a, a look at the revenue side. I just wanna note these revenues do not include measure E. Those are budgeted separately. The chart before you exhibit its historical growth over the past few years, caveat. The year we're in now, it actually did drop down. We had some one-time revenues come in 22, 23 that did not occur in this year. Uh, so for, as far as going into next year, we anticipate just under 4% revenue growth year over year. The forecast assumes about 3% on property taxes. Sales tax is 
a bit more conservative, anticipated increase at, at 1%. All other major revenue sources are either staying flat or increasing in the coming fiscal year. Now we're going to take a look at the expenditure side. The chart before you shows total general fund growing over time throughout the upcoming fiscal year, about 4.7 total percent increase is assumed. So I'm going to spend a minute talk about compensation costs. They're projected to increase by over $8 million from the current year estimate, year-end estimate, to the FY25 budget number. For some context, what that means is within this year, the year-end estimate does already factor in some cost savings that we've experienced. That's a normal thing for us to do. We do budget and with the presumption that all of our, mostly our positions are going to be filled throughout the year, which is often not the case. So we are going to have some savings this year. For compensation context, last year's adopted compensation budget was about $60 billion. The proposed for 25 is 63 5%, $5%, 3000000 million. So you hear that $8 million. Wow, it's really more like 3 in terms of what we expect. We do budget as if all positions basically are going to be filled. Spending outside of compensation is anticipated to be relatively flat or decreasing. The overall general fund expenditure budget is $92.4 million. Okay, so this, this next table is kind of busy, but what we're doing here is we're going to focus on the, the boxes that are in bold. That's telling a story, and what that story is is that we're keeping up our reserves and we're contributing to those annually. Uh, both the Opportunity Reserve and Reserve for Economic Uncertainty are projected to meet their target levels of 5 and 25% respectively for all years in the forecast. The General Fund also contributes to the Capital and Economic Development Reserves in all five years. The fiscal plan factors in key spending assumptions and revenue assumptions such as property and sales tax. As we mentioned, sales tax starts off conservatively, relatively flat 1%. Growth in sales tax for next year and the following. This is anticipated to be followed by steadier growth of 3% beginning in 27 and out years. So we were intentionally conservative in that regard. Property taxes and property taxes in lieu of vehicle license fees are also conservatively projected. Assumed growth is 3% in the coming year, followed by 4 to 5% in years after that. Increases in property values, new construction, and supplemental property taxes from real estate drive growth in property taxes. For expense assumptions, we do anticipate we, uh, we build in new sworn and non-sworn positions annually into the, into the forecast. We also uh, built in future impacts from negotiated compensation agreements. The continued practice of transferring out recycling and waste franchise fee revenue to the Capital Reserve Fund is also continued in this forecast, as well as additional payments programmed for the CalPERS unfunded liability and pension obligations. This concludes our discussion on the general fund. I will now transition to the forecast for the city's other major funds. Catch my breath and ask if you have any questions. <laughs> Hearing none, I shall move on. Okay. We'll start with the, the first forecast here. Uh, we will go into transportation and maintenance funds, the first of which is gas tax. Uh, we're anticipating modest revenue growth. Uh, this will continue, this will fund continued operations. This also includes preventive maintenance and capital projects, such as the second phase of the Old Town Streetscape project and bike and pedestrian, pedestrian crossing improvements. Senate Bill 1, local streets and roads forecast. Again, uh, steady revenue growth. Capital projects, uh, we anticipate pavement slurry sealing, resurfacing, and pavement rehab of city streets. CFD 2005-1 is Laguna Ridge. This is a maintenance services uh, community facilities district. Um, this levy assessed on the properties within this CFD was held at 70% uh, for many years, subject only to annual cost of living increases. Now that most of the area's amenities are in operation, expenses are now outpacing revenues. So the levy is assumed to increase annually 5% until it reaches its maximum levy amount in 2028. Significant annual expenditure growth is assumed, including expenditures for newer parks and the forecast. So we are partnering with the CSD, and staff will continue to pursue cost-saving measures to decrease the annual projected spending deficit in this fund. So we'll move on to Measure A, the maintenance component. Again, we're assuming modest revenue growth. Uh, capital projects included in this forecast are guardrail replacements, bridge preventive maintenance, and pavement maintenance. And that brings us to our enterprise funds. 
for drainage. Uh, modest revenue growth again is assumed. This will help sustain a positive fund balance due to uns <coughs> excuse me, unsustained positive fund balance. Capital expenditures are significantly higher in fiscal year 25 when compared to other years. Uh, this is due to unspent budget in the current year for several projects carrying the 25. Some of those projects are listed here as Laguna Creek and White House Creek Multifunction Corridor Project, uh, Storm Drain Improvements or Bond Road, as well as Phase Two Pump Station Improvements, Storm Drain Improvements at the Southeast Industrial Area, and of course the continuation of the Storm Drain Master Plan Update. And last but not least, recycling and waste. These funds pay for residential and commercial waste collection and hauling operations. They also pay for the operating costs at the Special Waste Collection Center. The fund balance in this fund continues to increase. Uh, this was accelerated when we paid off our bonds for the Special Waste and Collection Center in 2021. So there's no more debt service. Staff is uh, developing options on how to best utilize this fund balance. That brings us to proposed personnel changes for the coming year. Uh, the city recently concluded a comprehensive classification study which included various title changes. These are listed in the position control of the budget document. There are also nine reclassifications proposed which are listed in the staff report and they're also listed in the position control throughout the budget document. There are 15 new full-time equivalent positions proposed for the upcoming fiscal year, seven of which are conversions from contract to city staff. Four of those are in the general fund. Uh, one is in the city manager's office for communications marketing specialist. Admin assistant in human resources is a conversion from part-time to full-time and two at the animal shelter for a veterinary assistant and registered veterinary technician, respectively. As mentioned previously, Measure E is funding some new positions in the coming year, two police officers and two dispatch supervisors. And then again, mentioning that there are seven positions proposed to convert from contract staff to city staff. And these include uh, engineering manager, senior civil engineer, two engineers, an assistant engineer, construction supervisor, as well as an administrative assistant. And lastly, as part of the budget adoption process, council is being asked to adopt the following. The GAN limit is a constitutional spending cap that limits the tax revenue spending per capita. The city's general fund appropriation on an annual basis is well below the GAN limit. The city's investment policy is also being updated. This is a normal part of our annual process. And an updated salary schedule for fiscal year 25 is included in this item. This salary schedule incorporates salary and market adjustments consistent with the current MOU with the Police Officers Association, as well as the city's compensation policy for unrepresented employees. So at this time, staff will ask council to consider the resolution adopting the budget for the fiscal year 24-25, the annual appropriations limit, the fiscal year 24-25 investment policy, and updated citywide salary schedule. Uh, this concludes my presentation. I'm happy to receive any comments or questions or modifications uh, that council might have. Thank you for your uh, presentation. We'll ask questions afterwards. Um, at this time, I'll open up public comment opportunity and invite up uh, Lynn Wheat. Good evening, I did read it, got it done, and sent in my questions, and I wanna thank Mr. Bagwell for answering them thoroughly, so I don't have to bring those points before you, but I wanna talk about something that's kind of related to the budget, and I'd like you to consider it in the future. First, when we talk about the funding of the budget, we're saying it provides funding for city council projects. Are these for the people of Elk Grove, or are they for the city council? I would consider changing that wording as I see our budget supposed to go for all the people in the city. Second, when we talk about clean and safe public areas and we talk about graffiti cleanup, I'd like us to consider putting maybe some of the Measure E monies towards murals or putting um, vines along these walls that tend to be graffitied over and over. I'm thinking of over the 99 uh, overpass by Walmart, that wall continues to be graffitied. And then uh, $6 million of our measure e monies going into reserves. Is that really what the residents wanted? 
or did they want that money directed towards the quality of life and improvements within our city? I'm still hearing traffic complaints. As a matter of fact, this morning I talked to somebody that's a senior, and she's chosen not to go out on Saturdays anymore because there's so much traffic in Elk Grove. And in considering the traffic, how about um, uh, putting lanes, uh, defining the lanes and striping again, because going with all of the crack seal, the glare hits just right, and you can't see the striping on the, the streets. Now, it might just be my issue, but I see others kind of not staying in their lane. Now, they might be on their phone, might not, but whatever. If we could look at using some of those Measure E monies instead of putting them in to a reserve pot for your future priority projects. I think the residents of Elk Grove could define some future projects now, present projects that they'd like to see done. And then I appreciate that we're going to be looking about and using data-driven decision-making with our do dollars. And I'd be really interested. It mentioned that we created through our economic development department 503 jobs. I'd be really curious as to what those 503 jobs were and is it worth the money that we're investing in that. I did not see that in talking to residents that economic development was their primary concern. I heard more about traffic and homelessness and trash and other issues than bringing all these jobs. And it is concerning to me as far as the zoo goes, because I believe that's going to come out of the CFD monies. And if you look, there's one CFD debt bond that the city might have to pull from another one to cover that. Thank you. All right, with that, I will close the public comment opportunity and open it up for council comment. Um, if I may just say, state beforehand, um, we did receive a request from Council Member Suwin to not take action tonight. He, since he's not here, he would like to participate in the vote so we can ask our questions. So I think and it's a fair request. So we'll ask our questions and um, any, you know, any questions you have of staff. But... Um, my request would be to uh, delay the vote per or council member Suen's request. I don't know if that requires a formal motion or not. No? Seeing that, okay. You're all okay with that? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So we'll start with council member Spees. Any questions, comments? Sure. Yeah, actually, so actually if you could bring the, uh, I was going to stop you before. It probably would have been easier if, if you could have, uh, forgot to ask the question before. But I want to go back to the gas tax. And you may not need to bring the slide back up. Um, but... If I'm probably connecting two different items, right? But we hear about the statewide gas tax revenue decreasing over time relative to EVs, um, more efficient vehicles, et cetera. And so um, I had heard, and let me look at it here. So you're, you're expecting the revenues to increase in the future. Are these, are these two items that I'm connecting unnecessarily, or can you help me understand, get a little bit of understanding on your projections on the revenues? Sure, yeah, and where we get these uh, gas tax estimates, uh, it, it comes from a, um, <clears throat> I believe it's a, a it's someone associated with, and maybe you can help me out here, it's uh, someone with the League of California Cities, it's Mr. Michael Coleman, basically, yeah, that a lot of agencies up and down California uh, utilize the same information uh, that factors in many factors. Uh, in addition to what you're also considering. Uh, so yeah, we, we tend to use those figures that uh, there, there might be some other things going on there as well. Okay. It's, it's just interesting to me because again, you hear about, you know, fuel efficient vehicles yeah. um, and, you know, even in other locations, consideration of toll roads in order to pay for, for roads and such. And so I'm just kind of, uh, I'm trying to reconcile those two. So that's uh, some expert in the League of California Cities that makes this projection. Yeah. Okay. All right. But okay, Mr. Spe Mr. Spees, if, if I may, kind of add on yeah. to that, you can see that the revenues are pretty flat. They're basically sure. they're growing very, very modestly. It's particularly yeah, when, almost at almost at a CPI, right? It, I mean, it, it inflation probably le less than CPI right. when you look at the year-over-year -year increase, and especially relative to operating costs, it's right. not keeping up. Certainly, there's some going to be some impacts to the extent that EVs continue to become a larger part of the number of vehicles in the state. But we have a, a lot of vehicles in, in California, and that sure. EV 
population is still a pretty small proportion of the, of the total. But at some point, the rubber's going to hit the road, no pun intended, right? I mean, there's discussions in Sacramento to have a flat fee applied to EVs and the recognition that, you know, they're not contributing via the gas tax towards maintenance of streets and roads. So we'll see where those discussions head. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, I think you, did you have a question on the forecast before I move off to my questions? Since he's here. Um, not on the forecast well, on this one. It was more so on the waste management. Um, right, but it was, okay. Well, yeah. All right, well, then I'll keep going on. Um, so I think, I think, um, we're damn lucky to be in Elk Grove, folks. Um, I don't want to. I don't want to throw any shade on any neighbors, um, but we're having very, very different conversations than other uh, municipalities and agencies uh, are having throughout the state. And so, first and foremost, I'm going I'm to do a lot of thanking here. First and foremost, thanks to the public for your trust. I mean, almost two years ago, um, Nathan covered it, but almost two years ago. Uh, during record high inflation, the residents of El Grove in, uh, approved an increase to the sales tax, and um, that's that's a very um, that's a lot of trust that's put in us. And so I want to thank the public for that. Uh, the second part is I want to I want to thank that the Measure E Citizens Oversight Committee right? because they're they're doing their job and making sure that we're we're doing the right things, and making sure that money is spent in the right places. And uh, I want to thank staff, not just Nathan, but everybody else uh, who has been involved in putting the budget together. It is the lifeblood of the city, right? It, everything has some sort of connection back into that budget. That's simply what it is. But what I'm thrilled is that um, as I read through the budget, right, uh, staff has ensured that our budget is in line with the priorities. Um, I've said it in the past, I'll say it again, Elk Grove is where we are, not by accident. We've been making deliberate choices. Sometimes they're great, sometimes they're not so great. We don't always get it right. Um, but in general, we've been making the right decisions and moving in the right direction. Um, reducing crime is something that, you know, our, our residents are, you know, strongly in support of. I think we are very, very different here because of that. Um, addressing homelessness, I'll tell you what, I think there's three complaints that I get um, mostly. Um, you know, I, I see the average complaint about, uh, about uh, traffic, um, and, and that's, that's not to minimize the traffic complaint, but when I specifically get complaints about our homelessness, litter, and graffiti, those are the three things that I get complaints about. And so what I'm very happy about is that um, you know, we're gonna have a, a fantastic. I got a, I got a little preview on the uh, on the enhanced winter sanctuary today. Uh, the presentation, so you're gonna get a great update on that. I think I think we did some some really good things there, um, and of course I'll, I'll I'll give the credit to staff for doing a fantastic job with that, as I'll talk about later. But um, this budget um, continues to address homelessness. Um, clean and safe public spaces. We talked about that litter and graffiti. Um, I'm, I was happy today to see uh, the first of probably a few um, uh, images that came out for the, um, the litter campaign. I see you hiding back there, Kristen. Thank you so much for that. I'll tell you what, um, because people want a clean, safe place to live. That's what makes us different and there are times when it only takes one one ding dong to drive down the road and throw out a bag of of wendy's and you got crap all over the street right and it looks like it was like you know it looks like it was never cared for um but i'm really very glad that our public works and our and our um partners anti-trash group republic services like i mentioned before um and uh, I'm really glad that we can work together to make Elk Grove even cleaner. Um, you know, what's interesting is, you know, it's the, uh, the abatement issue or the litter, or excuse me, graffiti abatement issue um, that I think, you know, we, need to, we do need to consider some ivy or something growing there or whatever. I'm really glad to see the focus on graffiti. Thank you for that idea, Lynn. Um, there, I'm sure there are many others. I'm so glad that we're in a position where we can address things that seem like they don't make a difference, but they really do. 
and that, and uh, so I appreciate that. Um, you know, maintaining our streets. Drive around, drive around the area. Drive not just Elk Grove, but drive the, the surrounding areas. And again, I don't want to, I don't want to, um, you know, throw shadow on anybody. Um, but our streets are very well maintained. Thank you very much to the operations and maintenance of, of public works. Um, I'm glad that we're able to have our um, a funding level that's available uh, to keep our, our streets um, well maintained. So thank you very much for that. So um, we're not going to vote today. Um, I, I, I did, going again back to the uh, waste collection and some other previous ideas, I'm going to talk about those in my council comments to keep this clean. Um, but um, again, thank you so much. I think I think we have a, uh, a budget that is very well in line with our priorities. So I thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Council Member Robles. Mayor, can I just add add something? Um, sure. I know the request is to continue the item to the 26th for the final vote, which is totally fine. Um, I would just request if the council has any modifications or changes they'd like to see in the budget, direct those tonight so we can come back on the 26th and then take that vote. Council Member Robles. Councilman Spies, can I have my notes back? Thank you. So, uh, just kidding. Sorry. Um, no, thank you for the presentation. Um, thank you, staff, for the, the amazing hard work that you've done. Um, echoing what Councilmember Spies said, there's several different cities surrounding um, our city right now that are looking at how do they do a one cent increase uh, and put it on the ballot. Um, we were fortunate that our voters trusted us. Um, and with this trust, we've been able to present something that's uh, budget friendly and that we're looking forward for the future. Not only that, but we're investing. We're investing in our public safety and our roads. Um, we're investing in our small businesses, which is something that we as a city um, should be very proud of. Uh, we have sidewalks, we have uh, good paving roads, and um, I'm interested in hearing just a little bit more about the waste management. Uh, was there something that said that we would have a certain amount of money? Can you go back to that slide? Yeah, of course. So this is saying that we would, the, our bond would be paid off, so we'd be collecting a little bit more funds, correct? Yeah, if, we if actually I, paid our bonds off a couple of years ago, so we've had a, a growing fund balance. If you okay. Will. What do we do with that growing fund Like that we've had? Do we spend it on, where does it go, I guess? I can help answer that, Jason, if you don't mind. Yeah, so there is a significant fund balance here, and, and ultimately that will go to pay for repairs and expansion of our special waste collection center primarily. Okay. Uh, we will be coming back in a couple of weeks with the uh, recommended uh, adoption of a new contract with Clean Harbors, our service provider out of the special waste collection center. Uh, we're recommending adding an additional day of service. So some of that fund balance will go to pay for that additional day of service to include Saturdays. Um, you haven't seen that yet. It's coming in two weeks for you to consider. Um, uh, and then, you know, and, and we're also in the process this year, we just received proposals from uh, several companies to update the Nexus study that will identify ultimately how that money will be spent over time. So uh, uh, an update, a refinement that will assess the need to increase, decrease, keep the same, the administrative fee that's associated with the rates. Uh, so we'll be looking at that this year as well. Oh, perfect. Thank you. That was kind of the question um, that I had for that specific thing, but... Overall, just thank you to everyone, everyone for putting the hard work in. And as we continue to move as a city and move forward, um, we're in really well, some good standing compared to other cities surrounding us. So that's my comments. Councilmember Spies, you had a follow-up? Yeah, just one one quick go back. Um, um, I want to assure you, Jason, that I am not looking to add, in, in my comments later, I'm not looking <laughs> to add anything to this. I, I don't want you, oh my gosh, he's going to ask for something. It's for next year. It's a conversation for next year, so. You know, I just want to assure you that uh, no more surprises. This is good. I think this is baked. Okay. <laughs> Vice Mayor Brewer. No, I want everyone had really good comments, but I really appreciate your presentation tonight, Mr. Bagwell. Um, everything that is pretty much consistent to where we are as a city, where we're providing safety, resiliency, it's in tune with our values. It's in tune with our focus on what we don't want to do with infrastructure. And now we can actually focus on the next five years, the, the, the outset, because I think during the recessionary years, folks were concerned that 
we were going to have to take from one program to pay for another. And with the prosperity that we've received through all these, through all the tax revenues, through all the businesses that we've built and brought and attracted here, this allows us to actually think more clearly and focus a lot more. And Measure E speaks for itself. But as we've tried to educate people and stress to people, Measure E, the components from there, is a separate pot, bifurcated from the budget, bifurcated from the general fund. And that needs to be understood. Because I think there's a, there, there's a, a worry that we were going to congeal and put everything together, and that's not the case. We have our programs that are focused for public safety, fighting homelessness, and enhancing quality of life. As a matter of fact, as we talk about quality of life and talk about graffiti, as we're starting to put in a new ACE train route that will come into Elk Grove next year, people haven't talked about it, but the news has exposed it. So as you're coming in on the, on the railway, on, the, on this backside, um, you see a high degree of graffiti there. And that's not an image that people want to see or people want to have when they come into Elk Grove or as you're going to work in the Bay Area, leaving Elk Grove and coming back every night. So if there's anything we could do to help mitigate that, that would be helpful as well, just as much as we're seeing on the highways. Um, whether we use vines as an alternative, that's good, but we gotta keep in mind that vines are an invasive weed that can tear away at the infrastructure of your brick or cement structures. Um, but we have to think of something, you know, we got, because, because um, the more that individual, individuals feel emboldened and want to tag their name and want to live forever, by putting their, their stuff on the wall, we've got to figure out a way to make a, a, make a discouragement of it. Whether we find them heavy or do something, we'll figure it out and we'll work with PD to make that happen in code enforcement because that's, that's blight that we don't need. But I love what we're doing. We have funding that's coming in for the library, the widening of Camera Road, um, all done through various modes of, of funding. Um, but we're also looking at some possible federal funding that is not in our pockets yet, so we can't count it. But hopefully, knock on wood, cross our fingers, our eyes, and our toes, that that funding will come through. Because if it does, it will help us in our infrastructure efforts a lot better. And so I've um, been reading this budget for the last few weeks. I've been reading it for a month um, and read it again over the weekend and today, once again, just looking at the line items and all the projects. And the city has a lot to be proud of. We have a lot to be, to, to be um, very pleased about. And it's because of the hard work of our staff. Um, and don't play yourselves cheap, council members. Um, it's a lot of focus. We have, we, we have priorities that, we, that we, we're looking out for and looking out for for the betterment of the city. So. Take, take pride in that, take credit in that, because that's, that's hard work. There's a reason why we go gray here on this gig. At least I've grown gray here over the last three weeks. But um, don't look. But I think it's, I think it's good. It's, it's good work that we're doing, um, and, and I'll, be, I'll be happy to vote for it when we come back on the 26th. Not that it's not my birthday or anything, but don't worry about that. But I'm looking forward, uh, looking forward to voting on, on the 26th. 28, right? 28? Something like that. <laughs> um, excellent um, comments from my colleagues. I think I'm just really most proud of the fact that we don't have cuts to jobs, services, um, and programs. That's compelling. That is compelling, and that is worthy of celebration. I do also want to acknowledge all of the great work that staff has done, not just this year, but over the years keeping us fiscally strong. That is important. Our high quality of life that people have become, our residents have become accustomed to, our great streets, we're a safe community. Um, you know, these things matter. I also applaud the public engagement efforts, uh, very robust in getting feedback on the budget. And it's great to see Measure E dollars at good work and our capital improvement programs, all of the work that we're doing to accomplish those goals, and specifically the traffic signal enhancement 
and congestion relief. Looking forward to seeing that uh, implemented. So other than that, you know, it's a lot of great work that's gone on here, a lot to be a proud of, a lot to celebrate, but really most specifically, the fact that we are not cutting jobs um, and services and programs, that's huge. So thank you. And I look forward to voting on this at our next meeting. Thank you, thank you. very much. With that, we will go on to our next item, item 9.2. And that's to receive a summary report on the 2023-24 Enhanced Winter Sanctuary Program. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. I am here tonight to, um, I am Sarah Bontrager, Housing and Public Services Manager, um, here to uh, present to you your Enhanced Winter Sanctuary Summary. So by way of background, I know you are all aware, but for the public, um, the winter shelter uh, was located in the former Rite Aid building and the future Elk Grove Library. Um, this was a one-time use um, because it will go to construction as the library later this year. Uh, but we were able to use it to offer a winter shelter to adults um, up to 30 people per night and operating um, under a 24-7 model from November 1st to April 30th. It was originally planned for five months. We were able to extend it by one month. Uh, we partnered with the Gathering In, Placer County-based uh, nonprofit, to offer the shelter. Um, we did use a referral-only model, so our referral pathway was our two homeless services navigators. Um, who verified that folks uh, came from Elk Grove and were experiencing homelessness um, and enrolled them in the shelter. And we, um, we operated this as a low barrier shelter. So folks were able to bring their pets and a reasonable amount of their belongings, as well as a partner if they were in a relationship, um, which inspired um, some people to seek shelter because they, they were able to um, accommodate, in particular, the pets. We had many dogs, and I, I think we had one cat. So the most important thing was that this provided a safe place for folks to sleep. Um, you can see in the photo here that we had semi-private accommodations. They built little cubicles, each with a bed and a storage bin for folks. Um, the shelter also provided three meals a day plus snacks. Our food bank generously donated uh, food for the breakfast and lunch meals as well as snacks. And then dinners were often provided by some of our um, community groups. So the uh, building had restrooms and the gathering in brought in a shower trailer. So there were two shower stalls that folks could use. And our excellent facilities team was able to uh, install a washer and dryer in the facility so that folks were able to have one day a week that they could do their laundry um, and the shelter staff could wash towels and bedding. Um, one of the most important things about the shelter was the case management aspect of it that uh, folks had access to. Um, they made a lot of connections to behavioral health services, particularly our core wellness center. Uh, they were able to help people find housing and, uh, and actually move, um, and in some cases help people with building a resume or finding a job um, and transporting them to appointments, uh, medical appointments and other appointments that they needed to get to. So this was really a good example of how our community comes together. We had a lot of partners in this. The Gathering In, which did the operations, the Food Bank, which provided a lot of the food, Turning Point, uh, which provided behavioral health services to about 25% of the guests at the shelter, um, our Elk Grove Heart Group, which provided moving assistance in the form of security deposits and um, first month's rent, as well as coordinating actual people to move uh, families that were, or not family, households that were able to get housing. Um, and we had a lot of our nonprofits and faith-based organizations provide dinners or other donations um, there. So some statistics. Over the course of the shelter season, we had 62 unique guests, more men than women, um, eight, ranging in age from 20 to 72. Um, all, a vast majority of the guests had been homeless for at least 90 days. Um, a, 
a little less than two thirds had a substance use disorder, about 40% had a mental health condition, um, and we had a, a good percentage of folks who had a physical, develop, a physical disability or a developmental disability. Um, before they were staying in the shelter, uh, um, over half of our folks came from living outdoors, um, and most of the rest came from living in their cars. So we had a, a range in the length of stay. Some people stayed one night. Um, some people stayed all six months. The average length of stay was 72 nights, and we provided the equivalent of 3,800 nights of what would have been a motel if, if we'd um, given everybody an individual room. Um, about 44% of all known homeless adults in Elk Grove stayed at least one night at the shelter, which is a pretty good coverage rate. Overall, it cost us about $700,000 to operate the shelter for that time period. So we, um, we heard when we came to you with the shelter plan, we heard some concerns from our neighborhood, um, particularly the folks in the neighborhood immediately surrounding the shelter, including some of the business owners. Um, we did try to impact the, the uh, we tried to mitigate the impact on the neighborhood. Um, we held some outreach events to help people understand what was going to happen at the shelter, how it would work, to meet the staff. Um, we held a grand opening as well so people could walk through and see what it looked like set up. Um, TGI designated a main point of contact for residents and businesses. Um, and our PD parked a camera car in front and a camera on wheels at the rear of the site to provide some additional security. Um, and both our navigation team and our PD did some proactive canvassing of neighborhood businesses to try and identify problems early. And by and large, we heard that the businesses did not experience a lot of problems. So before I get into our successes on the shelter and next steps, um, I'm going to give an opportunity to Captain Brian Schopf to present some data from the police department on the neighborhood impact. Thank you, Sarah. Good evening, Mayor, Council Members. Uh, my name is uh, Captain Brian Schaff. Um, I'm the Division Commander for the, the Division that oversees our Community Resources Bureau, which includes our Homeless Outreach Team. And so um, we've gathered some data uh, based on some of the complaints that came in early in this in the Enhanced Winter uh, Sanctuary, and we wanted to provide that data um, kind of after the fact. So um, I'll go through this kind of slide by slide here, and um, hopefully um, it'll answer a lot of the questions that, that were raised by the community and um, some of those, those concerns. So uh, first, uh, the first slide you're looking at is the calls for service at the shelter. Now this is actually at the, uh, the 9260 Elk Grove Boulevard address. Um, and you, as you can see, there's uh, 78 total calls that includes the 37 self-initiated. So as um, Sarah had mentioned, there's uh, frequent contacts. We, we would go out there, we would do security checks, um, making sure that, uh, that our officers are present. Those are 37 times during that six month period. And so that 78 number is really, um, you know, really includes all of that. So um, as we look at that chart, you'll see the top five calls for service in that time. And those are security checks, as you might imagine. Follow-ups, meaning there's some sort of follow-up investigation or even um, some sort of follow-up to do with some of the services that we were offering. Um, disturbances, um, those include the, the verbal disturbances and trespasses. And then the fire and medical aid was actually ranked in the top five, which are not ours, they're, they're the CSDs. So, The next slide you're looking at is um, the calls for service within a 0.3 mile radius of the shelter. And 0.3 is not arbitrary. 0.3 is a walking distance from the shelter. It includes the services that would be available in that area. Um, it also includes many of the neighbors that, that had concerns about the, the sanctuary going in in that area. So we're seeing really a snapshot of that specific area. In, uh, in the, the same date range, 
The year prior, 11-1-22 through 4-30 of 23, there were 382 calls. Uh, we did see an increase, 11-1 um, of 23 through 4-30 of 24, to 513. Now that, is, that is a total amount of calls for service, okay? We're going to break those down just a little bit more because um, that, I think the, the next couple slides actually kind of give us a better detail of that. Um, <clears throat> this is the year prior, as I mentioned. So this is pre-opening. This is the year we, we don't have the, the winter sanctuary there. And what we're seeing here is fire and medical aid are the number one call. Um, these are our top 10 calls for service. Uh, person well check essentially uh, means that we're, we're checking on the welfare of someone in that area. It could be at a residence or it could be out in the public area. Um, as we go kind of down that in, in, in order, you see that there are kind of common calls for residential and business neighborhoods. There are traffic complaints, there's audible alarms, code enforcement, suspicious persons and vehicles, traffic abandoned, uh, which just means there's an abandoned vehicle. Now, as we get into the top 10 calls for service this year, during that six month period when the shelters open, what we actually see is there is a, a general increase in calls. Um, and I want to point out a couple of the, the categories as you, as you kind of walk down that, um, those top 10. Number one is always fire and medical. So it's the same from last, last year as it was, same number, same amount, same type. What did change is that we did have an increase and in what met this top 10 calls for service that wasn't in that previous year is the suspicious trespass, uh, noise disturbances, security checks, verbal disturbances, loitering, and suspicious circumstances. So those are some of the, the flip-flop, but you're not dealing with a, a high number of them. You're really dealing with uh, over that six-month period in the 20s. Um, this slide kind of demonstrates some of the efforts that we went to to ensure public safety and that we were doing the best we could to for crime prevention. Now, SEPTED, or CPTED, as you see on the top, is actually crime prevention through em em environmental design. And um, some of the things that we did ahead of that, trim back some bushes, some trees. Um, we placed uh, the cow, we call it the cow, but it's camera on wheels. It's the, uh, the, the patrol car that can't fit in the, the car wash anymore because it's got a big camera up on top and, uh, and a camera trailer. Additional, uh, there were some darker areas, we placed some lights. And so we really kind of tried to minimize the environment for crime to occur. And that's crime prevention. Um, in that effort, we had 2,290 hours worth of recorded video from that area. These are overt trailers, right? We want them to see that we're recording the area. That, that helps keep crime down. And then the last slide you'll see here is citywide. And we looked at the data citywide. Now, uh, there's some, some things I want to explain about this. Citywide, in the previous year, we had 16 arrests that involved homeless. Now, when we, when we talk about this, this is a, a key that the officer uh, keys in on that call for service that essentially designates that it, they're dealing with somebody who is experiencing homelessness. The year of the, the shelter, we had an increase citywide. Um, went from 16 to 29. Again, that requires that officer to, to hit that, that key. So um, reasoning behind this, I don't have it, but these are the numbers. So, um, and that's, that's essentially um, kind of a, an encapsulated data of the community impact um, from, from our perspective, from the, from the public safety perspective. So I'll be available for questions and comments. Um, and I'm gonna turn this back over to Sarah. Trying to get you back, but I don't know which one's yours. That one. There you go. All right. So now I'll share some of the successes that we had with the shelter. So you'll remember we had 62 people that stayed at least one night at our shelter. Of those people, 20 of them moved to permanent housing and three moved in with family or friends, which we hope will be a permanent situation. So 23 out of 62 people exited to um, some form of housing. 
Uh, a lot of them went to our affordable housing complexes. A lot of them went to room and boards or room rentals. And Turning Point, our partner, was really instrumental in helping us secure and pay for room and boards for a lot of folks, especially those who had um, some severe mental health challenges. Um, and then we did have one household that went to market rate housing. So outside of housing successes, about a quarter of our folks while they were at the shelter were connected with the Turning Point Behavioral Health Services and can continue to receive those services even though the shelter is closed now. Um, and our navigator and PD outreach teams are co really continuing to work with the folks. Um, we put a few of them in motels. Since the shelter closed, I think we've seen an additional three people get housed. Um, and we're continuing to work with a lot of the folks that, that exited the shelter back to the street to try and see if we can get them employment and housing or benefits. We've got some photos here, um, courtesy of TGI, of some of the folks that were able to find housing. So some of the lessons that we learned um, over the course of the shelter, um, the first and foremost is we really need a shelter. Um, and there is a need for a year-round shelter. Uh, a lot of the folks that ended up exiting when we closed the shelter would have stayed in the shelter had it continued to be open. Um, and we've seen a, a number of uh, people since the shelter closed that we would have enrolled in the shelter if we'd had it open. Um, Overall, our referral system worked really well. We were able to locate folks who were experiencing homelessness in our community and connect them with shelter quickly. When they were ready to go, there was usually a bed available and we were able to take them over there that same day and get them enrolled. Um, while they were there, we did case conferencing. So the city team worked with the TGI team to talk through each of the individuals who was in the shelter, what resources we might be able to connect them to, what, what they needed, um, and then use that information um, in many cases to connect with Elk Grove Heart or other nonprofit partners that could help to facilitate that, including some of the moving assistance. The shelter layout worked pretty well. You saw some photos of that with the semi-private space. Uh, that was nice for our residents and it worked well for the TGI staff to be able to see what was going on fairly easily, but to provide some amount of privacy to the folks who were staying at the shelter. Um, the 24-hour operation, I think, was really critical to the neighborhood impact. We did not have people queuing or loitering outside, waiting for the shelter to open or all exiting at 6 a.m., as you see with some of the nightly shelter programs. And so it was more of a trickle in and out during the day um, with a nighttime curfew uh, to make sure that folks weren't leaving in the, in the middle of the night. Um, we had an amazing amount of community collaboration. I covered a lot of that, and, and that's something that we would really look to continue in the next iteration of the shelter. Um, and then likewise, the connections to behavioral health services. That's so key for a lot of our individuals who struggle with their mental health or substance abuse. Um, we also learned that there were some things that we could do better. Uh, one is we did not give a lot of lead time to our operator, to TGI, um, and they struggled to hire staff quickly enough for the shelter to open. We only approved the shelter contract about a month before the shelter was expected to open, and getting staff hired and through background checks in that time frame was difficult. Um, likewise, the fact that the shelter was only temporary made it challenging to hire experienced staff. Many people are not going to leave a full-time job for a temporary position, um, and so that, that, that made it a challenge for TGI to hire and retain staff. Um, we did not require that people participate in case management, and I think that is something that we would look to do in the next iteration of the shelter. Um, having, having some requirement for folks to check in with a case manager and work towards goals uh, is, it would probably improve the outcomes. Um, we had some people who engaged a lot with case management and others who rarely did, and we saw that those that were more engaged were more likely to secure permanent housing. Um, fencing around the site would be ideal just to have a, um, a clear perimeter for the site. Um, and then finally, a commercial kitchen is something that we'd really desire. Um, we struggled with the, health, the county's health code requirements. 
Um, many nonprofits were not having access to a commercial kitchen, meant that they could not provide meals for the shelter or they had to buy them from a restaurant and deliver them. Um, and having a kitchen would, would provide an opportunity for nonprofits to come in and do their cooking in the facility, as well as an opportunity for job training for some of the guests as well. So we are hoping, um, we are planning for the next iteration of the shelter. Uh, we expect to release an RFP for the shelter operations team in July, and we are actively looking for a location for a shelter that we hope will open in November 1st uh, of this year. Um, we're looking at leasing or buying an existing building. Uh, we've um, looked at partnering with churches, um, other organizations that might not be fully utilizing their space. Um, we have also looked at uh, installing a temporary structure on public land. Um, long term, the desire is to build an actual shelter building uh, that, that could be set up the way, uh, the most efficient way. Um, but that may take a couple of years. Uh, so in the interim, we may need a, a temporary location for one or two years. So hopefully we'll be back at the council in the next few months with a location plan um, and with a, a shelter operator. So that's all I have tonight. I'm happy to answer any questions as I know Captain Shop is as well. Thank you. Thank you for that great presentation. At this time, I'll open up public comment, uh, public comment opportunity. We have one person signed up to speak, Nick Galling. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Nick Galling, Chief Program Officer with The Gathering In. My boss, Keith, wanted to be here today, but he couldn't, so you get me instead. Um, so 38%. 38% is the percentage of people that the gathering in served before the Enhanced Winter Sanctuary over a year period that went to improved housing. We are really proud of that number. 44% is the number from the Enhanced Winter Sanctuary. And of those, 74% went directly to permanent housing. So thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for the partnership. The people that got into housing, I want us to think a little bit about these 44%. They're no longer generating calls for service. They're no longer living on the streets. They're now living in homes, many of whom are working here in this community. They have faces, they have stories, and now they have hope. When discussing ways to reduce homelessness, I often reference the necessity of the three C's. And those are coordination, collaboration, and community. This city has all of those in abundance. Coordination, shout outs for the Public Works Department, the Police Department, City Manager's Office, Sarah, you and your team, Jack, Haimano, and David, world class. Collaboration, couldn't have done it without working with the community, many of whom have been mentioned, but the Good Shepherd, Hart, United Methodist, Marie and the Food Bank, Christy Cares, Brick House, Dos Coyotes, all the city departments that came by and did meals, and community. So the guests that we served were able to rediscover their dignity and their self-worth. They were able to integrate back into the community where they found health care, employment, and housing. The mission of the Gathering In is to meet people where they are, inspire hope, and walk alongside them on their journey to sustainable housing. Thank you to the city for the partnership and for these outcomes. And Mayor, I was at the State of the City address, so I think that we can all collectively say about the 23-24 Enhanced Winter Sanctuary mission accomplished. Thank you. Thank you, wow. Um, Nick was our final speaker, so I will close the public comment opportunity and open it up for council comments. Um, I'll start to the left. I'll start with our vice mayor. I want to thank Sarah and Captain Shaw for their uh, presentation. I want to thank the gathering in for being here and for Nick for sharing that data uh, because that, that is a success story because uh, we didn't know what we were going to expect coming into this um, exercise. Um, but, I'm, but, but it, came, it turned out really well, and so, so, so well 
I believe people want to see more from it, want to see more success. And the question is, how do we do that? And where is that, lo- where is that location going to be? And so it's, um, it's something where we're, we're all going to be very, very much working together with arm in arm because it's, very, it's important that we help people make that transition from being homeless to being on their own, um, standing on their two feet and, and proudly um, doing their part to be a, a, a part of society in a very positive way. And that's, what, that's what we all strive to do. And that's what we all want to do. We all want to, we all want to seek the goodness and, 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 be, and be those forces of good. And so and that's very much something that I've, I feel real, feel very strongly about, but very, uh, very thankful and showing a lot of gratitude for, for the work that was done. This is very, very important and very, very beautiful. So I want to thank you. Thank you, um, Councilmember Robles. Thank you, Madam Mayor, and thank you, Con- uh, Vice Mayor, for your comments. Um, thank you to Ms. Bontrager and your team. Uh, you guys have been just amazing, and I think our community realizes and sees that. Um, thank you to staff for been working hard. Uh, thank you to the gathering in. And Nick, thank you for being here today. Um, you know, when we talk about homelessness, individuals and folks get upset right away and they think it's somebody who, who's sticking a needle in their arm and crime and, and, and they just go on and on. But there's never a realization that we're talking about people and that we need to put people before anything else. Um, so I'm super happy with, with the work that's been done and I'm excited that, you know, uh, was it 20 folks that, that were housed out of this? 20 directly to permanent housing and then more into some improved temporary housing. 20 to permanent housing. That's that's a win. Um, we want more, but that right there is a win, especially in a county that's that's um, suffering right now, even though homelessness went down a little bit, but folks are, are not getting housed. So thank you for the work and thank you for the dedication and thank you to your officers who have been responding and working extremely hard on this. Um, you know, I love that there was a lessons learned, right? So in, in the military, we kind of use AAR, you know, after action review. And it's taken the, what we learned, what worked and what didn't work, and how can we improve that. Um, and I'm happy that as a city, we're doing that, you know. We're, we're, we're looking at what didn't work and what can we do. And thank you for bringing it up to us that, you know, you, you need a kitchen, right? It saves on money. Um, there can possibly be a class where folks will learn how to cook. Um, and then stuff like that. So thank you for that. Uh, that's something that's now on our radar. We can also look at spots and possibly doing something as that. Um, thank you for, for letting us know that we need to continue up with um, looking for a new area. I, I you know, I'm willing to, to, to help out and try to find a, either an open lot or, or area where we can do something so that we can house people. Um, again, once you go out there and serve and volunteer, you see people's faces, but you also get their names and you get their stories. And it's awesome, the impact that you're making. So uh, thank you for this presentation. Uh, I do have a little bit just kind of curious as far as for the numbers. Um, it went from 16 to, to I think, 29. Yep, 16 to 29. Um, would you say that those calls or those incidents, were they hostile or were they pretty much like making sure that it was... Was it a, was it a, one of our peace officers that went and assisted, or just kind of curious as to that? So it, what we're talking about is the uh, is the overall. I can bring that up. The overall calls for service citywide. Okay, citywide, citywide. And so it's not necessarily in that point three area around the the sanctuary, and it's not at the sanctuary location. Okay. Um, a couple of uh, things can can play into that. Number one. The data is only as good as what's put into it. Yeah. So um, it requires that officer to hit that button. Number two, in, and Sarah and I spoke about this earlier, is that every time there's enforcement in our neighboring areas, we get an influx. Mm-hmm. And okay. um, in speaking with some of our homeless outreach um, officers, um, some of, the, area, some of the, the people that they were dealing with while the winter sanctuary was going on were from out of the area. They weren't our normal people. Okay. So... That could be an explanation for it. 
but it's it's a really hard to tell. It's a number. Oh, so, absolutely. But yeah. thank you for for bringing that up and letting yeah. us know, and so that we are aware of what's what's occurring daily in, in our community. So we really truly appreciate it. And absolutely. That's a majority absolutely. of the comments that I have in questions. So thank you. Thank, thank you. you, Councilmember Spees. Okay, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, first of all, in terms of uh, the point in time count, are we going to have a different uh, presentation on that sometime in the future? Is or was that were we intending to bring that, uh, that item at some point? I mean, I don't want to. I don't want to include any questions here if we're going to have something down the road. So we, um, my intent was to take that to the homelessness ad hoc committee. Okay. Um, and then from there, the committee can make a recommendation if they'd like it raised up to the full council. Okay, perfect. Then I will leave it right there. Um, so um, first, uh, I, I don't know if everyone remembers the last time we had a, you know a, a, this discussion uh, at the beginning, um, but my family has a family member who. Uh, has uh, experienced chronic homelessness. And so it's a very difficult thing for our family. Um, it isn't something that, uh, you know, um, it's not something that anybody is proud of. Um, however, it is very painful, um, particularly when you have someone on the street um, that you know and love and care about. And um, it's, it is very, very difficult. It is very difficult to love them, but you do. So um, this is a, an issue that is near and dear to my heart. And so um, I, I think back at that same meeting, I said I would, I would consider it a success if we had six to seven. I am so glad that my number was low. Honestly, that is, that is fantastic. And I, I, wasn't, I wasn't saying it in terms of I don't think you can do it, but I, I've, I, I felt that it, it's very difficult to get the participation um, um, that you need in order to get them back onto the road to health. And so um, thank you for that. I exceeded my expectations. You know, um, Ms. Bontrager had the opportunity today to come talk at our Rotary Club today, so I got a little bit of a preview on this. Um, and uh, I did get to do, a, you know, a little uh, ode to Sarah Bontrager during my, uh, during my comments at the meeting. Um, but... Two things from that. Um, I had an opportunity to talk with um, Pastor Jay afterwards. And, you know, I talked a little bit about the frustrations of, of how, you know, we can solve homelessness and our, and our ability to. And he said, you know, Kevin, he says, there's, there's two types of problems that we have in this world. Problems that we can solve and problems that we can manage, right? Um, for us in the city of Elk Grove, um, given the scope of what we can do, the, the ability to solve the homeless problem is very, very low, right? There are, there are so many things that, are, um, that we don't have control over, you know, affordability of housing, um, you know, uh, mental health, uh, you know, drug addiction, et cetera. Those are things that we simply don't have the scope to control, but we do have the ability to manage them. And I think that this year... Um, with um, the efforts of staff, and of course, um, which includes PD, and of course, the gathering in, I think uh, I think we did a very very good job. And so, um, there is no Oscars for uh, homelessness um, uh, management or anything like that. Um, so, I do want to take another opportunity again um, to thank Miss Bontrager, Hi Mano. Jack and David, um, because this is a very it's a it's a really difficult problem, um, and I I appreciate that uh, sometimes Sarah comes with ideas that I'm not terribly interested in. Uh, I don't, we don't always agree, right? Um, uh, but what I appreciate about Sarah is that she's not afraid to challenge, um, and I appreciate that when you know she's that uh, you. Um, work with us to find the right solution. Um, and again, while there's while there's no Oscar for you this year, you know, um, if if there certain if there was, I would certainly give one to your team and uh, to the gathering in and PD because this was this was fantastic, right? So I'll park it there. Thank you very much. 
Thank you. Thank you to my colleagues for your excellent comments. I too want to thank you, Sarah, for all of your hard work, the gathering in, our police department, for your compassionate care in working with a very vulnerable population. That means the world to me, that, that compassionate care. These are human beings. They're not case files, they're people. And seeing those pictures of hope, that word hope changes lives. When we invest in people, when we give them a reason to have hope, it's transformative. So I am a very strong proponent for a year-long year shelter um, in, in working with our city staff to see this realized. It is important because I, it, I still, to this day, think about those when April 1st came, what happens to them and where they are. I'm glad that some have already found housing and jobs, and some are in hotels, but some aren't. And that just hurts. That still hurts. So to the extent that, you know, what we need to do in terms of priorities, a priority is to have a year-long shelter where we can continue to see the amazing results that we've seen in that six-month period. Imagine what we could do in 12 months, every day, every, you know, year-round. Year so that is something that, you know, will continuously be uh, a priority. And then I think, you know, to Council Member Spee's, your point there, in, when it comes to affordable housing, we do have a lot of say. Um, and that absolutely will remain a priority for the City Council. Um, it is a priority for me to continue to invest in affordable housing, permanent supportive housing. Our numbers are great regionally but we, I, I never want to rest there. We need to do more. We need to do more constantly. So affordable housing is something that we can control. But um, those other services, if we have a year-long uh, you know, shelter and we have permanent supportive housing and affordable housing, then we can start to address some of those other needs uh, by having those wraparound services at these various facilities which will go a long way to meeting the needs and meeting our community, our residents, where they are in terms of what they need. So thank you for this um, great presentation. We still have a lot of work to do, um, but I love seeing those numbers. I love seeing the, the success stories. And the more success stories, the better, but that's gonna require more investment from us. And you have my commitment to make, you know, for, for where, where, I'm, where I sit, is to continue to be supportive of those efforts so that we can continue to serve our most vulnerable population. So did you have a follow-up, sir? I did, thank you, Madam Mayor. I appreciate you pointing out what I think might have been a mis yes. misspoken uh, <laughs> thing. When I, 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 what I meant to say was affordability of housing, yes. not about affordable housing. We certainly have some control over that and responsibility. So thank you for pointing that out. Thank you. I knew it was. <laughs> I <know. laughs> but thank you, and thank you to my colleagues who continue to invest in priorities um, such as addressing homelessness, but most importantly, improving the lives of those that need it most. So thank you, everyone, for your respective role in this. All right. Um, with that, we will move on um, to our next item. That is item 9.3, which is to consider appointment of one voting member to the Disability Advisory Committee. Good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor, and Council Members. I'm Jason Lindgren, your City Clerk. In April, our committee member Bruce Cager stepped down from the Disability Advisory Committee. You authorized a recruitment. We received two applications. The two applicants are here this evening to speak, and that's my summary of this item. So, uh, and up for consideration is appointment of one member. All right, very good. At this time, I will um, open up the public comment opportunity and invite up Stephanie Dawkins, and after that, uh, Daisy Hughes. Thank you, and I am delighted to be here. I'm Stephanie Dawkins, and I am honored and humbled to be here and a part of this Elk Grove community. Um, I was very highly motivated to join the Disability Advisory Committee because that is one lively group of folks, and they know their stuff. Um, so happy to have had the privilege of 
um, joining them in a meeting. Um, I have been an advocate of uh, disability um, inclusion and efforts my entire life. I am the child of a blind parent and I am the parent of a disabled daughter. So I have had moments of trying to escort my parent around uh, buckled sidewalks, things of that nature, um, understanding what kind of resources would be necessary, um, and then growing through all of that with my, um, with my daughter. So I've seen it up close. I've lived the experience. I know exactly what that walk is because I walk it every day. Um, as a professional, um, I have uh, lots of experience. Uh, I am an ethics and compliance professional um, and also a neurodiversity and champion and coach uh, in the corporate environment. Um, I have quite a bit of experience in public service. Uh, I have been part of the uh, Fremont Unified School District Disability Advisory Committee before moving here to Elk Grove and um, been part of both Fortune 500 companies and Fortune 100 companies, um, serving as a leader for accessibility, uh, education, ethics, and compliance. Um, I would be delighted to be a part of this. I was listening to the presentation on the Winter Sanctuary, understanding what is going on with um, mental health issues, because that is also part of disability. Um, I, since joining, uh, since, I'm sorry, moving here to Oak Grove, uh, been a part of the community garden. I was at the Republic Services compost workshop that they um, spoke about and have also been part of a group called Mending of Mothers that serves unhoused residents um, here in this area and been really hands-on, uh, help provide financial literacy workshops and things of that nature. Um, so it is with a great keen interest, um, many, many years of service, um, both as a professional within my community, um, helping to implement the state of California law that defines paralegal, so I know what it's like to take something from beginning to end. I know the trials, I know the journeys, and I know the triumphs, and I would like to be a part of that in the city of Elk Grove, but I am here to serve. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, next up is Daisy Hughes. Hi, good evening, Mayor and Council Members. Yes, my name is Daisy Hughes, and I have been a resident of Elk Grove for the past 14 years, where I have lived happily. I applied for this position, with this vacancy with the Disability Advisory Committee, because I want to serve Elk Grove. I love Elk Grove, and I feel that I would be a good fit for this position, mostly because of my professional experience. For the past 17 years, I have been an attorney in the field of disability rights laws, but really in the context of government operations, I work for a state department, the Department of Rehabilitation. And in that role over my career, I have developed a deep awareness of the challenges that individuals with disabilities face. I have knowledge and expertise regarding the requirements of accessibility and inclusion. And I believe that I have the knowledge and experience that um, would be of benefit to the Disability Advisory Committee. And I also have attended a few Disability Advisory Committee meetings, and I find the members to be caring, compassionate, knowledgeable, and I would enjoy working with them for years to come. So thank you so much for your consideration. All right. Thank you, Ms. Hughes. Um, this is a difficult one. <laughs> These are never easy. Um, I actually, I'm going to, I would love to hear some of your input because I'm torn. I'm 50-50 here. So we have both applicants here. So that's commendable. I, I always, you know, look, one, are, are you going to show up and advocate for yourself for this, uh, for this position? I do have a soft spot for those that have applied before. I think that that um, shows tenacity. Um, but I'm also looking at the, the geographic breakdown. So I see we have two members from District 1 
We have one in District 2, one in District 4, so obviously none in 3. So a lot of, lot of, lot of things, but it's, you know, I think the, ge the geography for something like this, not as important, but it's there. It is a checklist there. Um, one applicant did reach out, uh, and so that, that is important as well. So I'm curious to have, uh, do you, anybody here, do you, and I know that I'm deferring here, but I'm doing that on purpose. <laughs> but I would love, because I'm torn, <laughs> um, I would love to hear some of your thoughts on what you're looking for. Maybe you don't necessarily reveal a person, but um, what matters to you more? If, um, because, I, you know, if you look at on paper here, the, the resumes, both very compelling and have great personal um, stories of why, and, uh, why they would make a great applicant. All right, well, I'll stick my neck out a little bit. Um, I've, <laughs> uh, I, I have had the opportunity to uh, meet with Miss Hughes in the past. Um, she was a very strong advocate, very strong, extremely strong advocate <laughs> uh, <laughs> for, uh, for her neighborhood uh, and for her area in, in previous um, uh, issues. Um, and so on that and that alone, I mean, because... Uh, mm -hmm. Both fantastic. Um, I think I think we we could we could do well to have to have either of you. But based specifically on that, um, I think you know for me um, I could support Miss Hughes um, just a bit better only because I know how tenacious she can be. <laughs> Absolutely, and I will say you, yes that I I know because I'm from that neighborhood. <laughs> <laughs> it might be the lawyer in her. I don't know. I think it's passion. <laughs> I want to say thank you for applying for both of us, you know, um, to the both applicants. Thank you. It takes um, it takes the willingness to want to serve. And not many folks out of, what is it, 180,000 going to 200,000, not many folks are willing to sit here throughout the whole city council meeting just to, to wait for this. Um, I agree. This is a difficult choice. Um, <laughs> I wish we had more commissions so that we could put more people in, right? Because um, I believe that putting service and putting people before uh, um, yourself is, is really rewarding. Um, I did have a, a call today. I did speak to Mrs. Hughes. Um, thank you for reaching out, uh, for spending some time uh, getting to know you a little bit more and, and hearing your passions. Um, so I appreciate that. and. I think with that, um, mm -hmm. I agree with Councilman Spees. Vice Mayor, you want to provide me any guidance to take under <laughs> consideration? <laughs> well, I, I just had uh, I just had the luxury of just going through the the resumes and going and just looking through their exper their past experiences and what they brought to the table. And it was probably good that none of them reached out to me <laughs> because. Um, <laughs> Because I because I wanted to really make an objective decision based on um, their qualifications, what they bring to the table. Um, you have the professional experience blended into it. Um, one of the candidates, based on today's um, presentation, really spoke to me as a person who has family and is taking care of family. In the, dis, in, the, in the disabled space. You have a parent that um, you grew up with. You have a child who you are raising. And it feels like when you are an, an individual who is a caretaker, you're, you're basically representative representation of that sandwich generation who is taking care of um, family on both sides of the generation spectrum. It feels like that there is skin in the game on what you can bring based on those experiences. And in a lot of ways, that's where Stephanie Dawkins kind of, uh, really speaks to me in that respect. Um, because I, in a way, I, I, can, I, I can kind of empathize with that um, based on knowing, having cousins in my family who have experienced that and experiencing that dynamic because you're bringing a real world experience also. Both of them bring real, real world experiences, but it feels like Stephanie Dawkins 
can definitely be a, a strong advisory committee member and advocate um, in that respect to the Disability Advisory Committee. And that's, uh, that's where I'm, I'm kind of, I am leaning towards Stephanie Dawkins as, as my recommendation. Um, so thank you, colleagues. You've not helped me at all. <laughs> 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 I knew it would be a difficult decision. Um, both, of, both of the candidates bring invaluable um, passion, experience um, to the table. But I think that um, for some, you know, showing that commitment to want to, to be a part of this and coming back, I think just is giving that little bit of extra edge. So at this time, um, and it's for no disrespect um, for Stephanie, um, please continue to apply. But my recommendation tonight will be for Daisy Hughes. And um, for Ms. Dawkins, please stay engaged um, with, the, with the committee. O openings occur all the time. And again, seeing that the tenacity paid off, um, I will certainly be looking for your application in the next go around. So thank you again for your passion and your commitment. And please stay involved in the committee. You don't have to be a voting member to shape policy. Please show up, please participate, and raise your, your awareness, particularly with a parent perspective. So tonight, I bring to you Daisy Hughes as our appointee. All right. Thank you. So we will move on to our next item, and that is council comments, reports, and future agenda items. Uh, Councilmember Robles, anything to report? Yeah, so we had a uh, regional... Uh, Sex sewer regional sand meeting we're getting together so uh we talked about the harvest water and all the projects that's occurring here in elk grove uh, we did talk about the road and all the outreach that we've been doing so exciting stuff um, a lot of my colleagues reminded me that this was i believe a 20-year project so since i'm the freshman on the board um, they were just you know letting me know that this is a uh, that, that I'm, we are welcome, for, essentially. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, but it was a good meeting. Look forward uh, for the next coming months and hear more about it. So please be bear with us when it comes to the traffic. We're, we're working on uh, doing this. So, All right. Council Member Spees? Oh, yes. Uh, so two things. I guess everything's been two things tonight. Two things. Uh, first thing, <laughs> the uh, Sacramento Metropolitan Cable Television Commission um, continues its search uh, for an executive director. Um, so please uh, keep an eye open for uh, that opening. It is, it is a smaller uh, commission and the position is part-time. Of course, none of you here <laughs> are allowed to leave for it. Everyone here needs to stay. But for the public, um, if you have interest in that, um, please look to the Sacramento Metropolitan Cable Television Commission. Uh, okay, so then the second thing. And... Um, in the last meeting, and even maybe a meeting prior, uh, I had a hodgepodge of different suggestions relative to perhaps, or relative to say, uh, transportation, the bus, um, and then I think um, um, uh, Councilman um, Robles uh, had discussed, you know, the the potential to do um, a uh, you know a, a small stipend. Um, to go along with our um, economic development uh, workforce, excuse me, workforce development. And so um, given the conversation tonight about uh, the, the increase in rates, right, I, I wanted to do this in a little bit more of a controlled or more well thought out um, measure, but I think um, because of the conversation tonight, I wanted to take all of the, what we've been talking about in bringing back and kind of go to a, a, a higher, more global perspective and to say, can we please investigate things that w are within the scope of the city? So busing, um, workforce development, um, waste management, right? Can we take a look at ways to make the pain a little less for those folks who do not have the ability 
to increase their their uh, SSI, their their social security, right? So something like you know if you're if you're over the age of of sixty five and you your sole source of income is social security, are there things that are serve are there services that we provide that we could help ease the pain a little bit, right? So it would be limited or not. Uh, it would not just include waste management, buses, et cetera, or workforce development. Um, but w- so again, I guess what I'm what I'm trying to ask for is, can we come back with some ways to help people who who need that help? Does that does that make sense? I don't want to limit to just those little ideas that we've had. I think it's better to have a what can the city do to help those who need a little bit of help easing the pain. Does that make sense? Are, we, are these like grants, or what do you have in mind? It's, it's, it could be a reduction in rate for someone who's over 65 but is only on, on Social Security, right? It could be, uh, you know, free fare for uh, seniors over 65 who don't have, you know, who, who rely on Social Security, right? I'm looking for ideas. Sure. Instead of just taking those... Yeah, us for some potential suggestions to help yes. people that ha- are low income that may need additional assistance. Right. Uh, With, within the scope of the services that we sure, provide. Things we're already providing. Correct. I, I think we can absolutely do that. We can also bring back to you some information about maybe programs that we already offer to low Correct. income residents that residents may not even be aware right. of. That, so yeah. we can couple that with any additional thoughts that we might have that we can offer right. as possibilities. I right. think that's what you're saying. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Because when I thought about it, we all, had, or, you know, we had, all of us had different ideas, right? But I think that staff has brilliant ideas that we, just by the way we were having the conversation, we were limiting it to certain ideas. And so um, I'd like to see if there are other opportunities to help those who need a little bit of help. Yeah. So, understood. Is that, I'm in, is that agree- good I'm in, I'm, I'm okay. in agreement yeah. with that. I think there's several folks who we yeah. don't see who are unseen, who are living paycheck to paycheck. Um, and I think it's, as a city, I think we need to help them out too. We can't forget about those folks. Um, so I, I agree with what you're saying. And I, as I recall, during COVID, there was a lot of creativity nationwide on different kinds of programs that offered assistance. So I don't know that we have to reinvent the wheel. I think there, there might be existing programs and platforms that we can tap into. And I know that during COVID, there were a lot of opportunities um, deferrals, just grants, just, you know, different opportunities um, that were there. So, yeah, I would support that. And that wasn't an ask for this year. See, I told you I wasn't going <laughs> to ask for anything more in the budget. That's, that's you know, I'd like to have, you know, purposeful, thoughtful conversation about it and see what we can do for next year. Right. Okay. And I, so in, in order to implement that, one, do we have, I'm sure you'll review sort of staff allocation departments, how this, what this would look like. I envision we, what we'd bring back just some brainstorming, right? Some ideas, yeah. some thoughts, and then implications of those, whether they're staffing implications, yeah. uh, budget implications, all those things, and we can then talk through that. Okay. Vice Mayor, anything to report? Uh, so on Monday, the Sacramento Public Library uh, Board uh, met and considered something significant for the Sacramento Public Library staff. So negotiations for their local Union 39 have been taking place. Those negotiations appear to hit a successful stream. And so um, that was voted on by the board in Monday's meeting. And then at the RT, Sacramento Regional Transit Board meeting, um, a discussion was had on on affordability. Um, One of the things that that was adopted as part of their policies and that they reported on as part of the, um, the budget process was the Smart Rider program for students. It looks like it's going to be more of a regional effort where all cities are going to play a part in it. Um, I believe school districts, I believe. But uh, regional transit, um, as part of their talks on how to handle the Smart Rider program for Sacramento, um, the general manager in his report had mentioned that the Smart Rider program was going to take place throughout all the participating cities in the region, um, which was 
good news um, and, and something. Are you talking about the of, ride free, right? Yeah. 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 I know I, that I, I Sacramento call, call has smart, budget cuts on I call, that. I call it the smart rider program, yeah. but, but it's one of those deals where students yeah. um, from K through 12, if they have a nice little red card, they ride for free. And so it sounds like it's a good idea. Uh, kind of dovetails on what we can do for seniors in that respect because I know RT has the paratransit and they also have the on-demand um, rider uh, uh, transportation program that um, that can pick seniors up and and take them where they need to go. But it's an on-demand service. Definitely something to look at um, and discuss. But there was another thing I was looking, I, I've been thinking about for a while is that um, a couple of years ago, we had a program for recycling of uh, oil and different products that go into your car or motorcycle. And because of the lack of, of involvement in the program, we, it was the city program, not a public services program. We stopped doing it. Um, if there's a way for us to con start considering if we can bring that back, how we can bring that back. Can it be an on-demand program just to help save money? Save, save dollars, but also really try to do our part to help those who do not have access to a milk carton container or because for whatever reason they're vegetarian and don't drink um, milk, but they do almond milk or oat milk and have the containers. Is there something we can do to where we can provide uh, a service to those individuals on demand? Um, so they can dispose of car oil or transmission fluids if they, when they do it at their house. But we can work with them in some sort of way to get it out to the waste recycling center um, in, in, in the city. Uh, because I am starting to get more than just one call on this issue. Now I'm starting to get five. And so um, anything we could do to start thinking about what we can do in that process would be very helpful. Um, I don't, is, I'm not aware of that program, but does the city manager want to offer up any insight? You're talking about the used oil collection program. I know we have, um, Jeff, maybe you could speak more to the current programs that, that we offer and the options that are available to residents. Yeah. We offer several used oil collection events throughout the year. We actually do a, a great job of getting grants from Cal Recycle for that program. In fact, we just uh, signed the, the form to submit for the grant again this year. And so I can get back to you with more information on what services we do offer. I believe we offer curbside pickup as well. I think Ray mentioned in his pre presentation this evening, uh, but I definitely know we have the, the events at like your local AutoZone or um, O'Reilly Auto Parts. So uh, I'll get back to you with more information on, on the curbside services as well. Thank you very much. Absolutely. All right, uh, STA tomorrow. So that'll be fun times. Um, <laughs> yeah, there's a, a lot going on. But um, let's see, I did go to Glenbrook earlier this evening on my way here, and they wanted me to report out to all of you that just their little tiny community, they raised $54,000 for the building of the new zoo. $54,000 in Glenbrook alone. A lot of excitement, a lot of passion there. So they asked me to stop by and recognize the residents and thank the residents. They're they're very excited. So, but I wanted to share that a little nugget of good news that fifty four thousand dollars from one little neighborhood. So, um, District Four representing. So, um, okay. It. It's, <laughs> <laughs> um, so with that, um, I will go ahead and adjourn this meeting at nine fifteen p.m. Thank you, everyone. Have a great evening.